Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday night Fundamental Arduino stream. You know me, I'm Jeff Glass. Welcome back. Hope y'all had a chill week. Um, I, mine was so chill. I don't know where this week went, but all of a sudden it was Friday afternoon and I hadn't built anything for today. I literally had touched nothing. Um, so I had a very exciting last couple of days, <laughs> last 48 hours getting things ready for this. Um, but it's been a lot of fun and uh, it's been a good way to keep busy on the weekend. Um, but I hope, uh, I hope your week's been good. I hope y'all are staying safe out there and all those usual things. Um, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> so, okay, so you probably all know, um, tonight we're talking about remote controls for, uh, Arduino systems, both using remotes to control Arduinos and how the Arduino can act as a remote control to control other things. So I needed something that could be controlled by a remote control to do our demos tonight. And so what I have... Um, is a DVD player up on top here. I'm actually running into a modulator and then going into the RF input on the back of this old CRT TV. And uh, for the content tonight, um, we'll be using uh, my favorite movie, not saying it's the best movie, but my favorite movie, Hunt for Red October, starring Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin and Tim Curry <laughs> and a whole cast of great people. Um, so yeah, I forgot I had put, I'd paused Sean up there, uh, at the beginning of this evening. <laughs> um, we'll turn him off in a second here, but I like to think that in the course of this evening, Sean is, Sean is watching over us, um, as we, uh, as we progress through tonight. Mm. As usual, I'm cracking a cold one for tonight. Um, tonight I am drinking an Ironica IPA from Five Rabbit Brewery here in Illinois. Ooh, that's a nice shot, right? A can, a can. Ooh, tasteful. <laughs> Um, what are y'all drinking out there tonight? Uh, I know Chris had some some beer specifically in mind for tonight, but as always, no pressure if drinking's not your thing. Totally cool, um, but at least have some water and hydrate because hydration is important. Mm. We're uh, we're gonna wait just just another minute here to get started as we always do. We wait for stragglers and then we will dive right into some stuff. Yeah, Travis, it's funny, I've now was like, oh, what what beer should I, <laughs> it's so dumb, right? What beer, what beer looks good on camera? It's like, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. I'm trying to do a different one every week and we've been trying to support local recently because it's a nice thing to do. Um, and so we hadn't had any Five Rabbit yet and it just seemed good. Yeah, Travis, if you bring me your um, your remote controlled blinds uh, machine that you guys are building, I'll bring you some beer. We'll do that trade. Seems like a fair thing. Mm. Lots of good people out there tonight. Brian's here, hi Brian. Kenneth, as always, with the hype. Michael and Chris and Lee. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, well, it'll be a fun Sunday night. Um, We will see how broken things get tonight. Um, We're going to have the return of the LCD screen RGB thing that we were fiddling with last week. We're going to use to do a remote demo again tonight. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think it's holding together a little bit better now. Um. Yeah, we might break some things. It might happen. Um, but it's it's also kind of cool because, like, we're only going to do one topic tonight. We're going to talk about remotes. But it's going to layer in basically everything that we have talked about so far. Um, we're going to use some of the electricity knowledge we gained. We're, of course, going to use the basic programming knowledge. The digital stuff, the analog stuff, we're going to use the transistor and FET knowledge we talked about a few weeks ago. Like, I'm actually, it was it, the demos are not super complicated, but I was super excited when we were putting them together. Um just to see like, oh, we actually gonna make use of a lot of different parts of things. Um, and as usual, because we only, you know, we're, we're, I'm trying to keep these topics more condensed than the sort of like all of electricity in one evening, um, specifically so that you guys can like ask questions or like, hey, could you write the code so that it does X instead of Y? Um, we had a little bit of that last week. I know I, Chris made a suggestion and we, we tried to write it up and I, I misunderstood what the thing was. Um, but if you're like, hey, this is a cool thing that you're doing. It kind of sparks an idea in my head. Could you do it this other way? Or could you make it do X thing? Um, I think we'll have time tonight to play around with some of that just because that would be kind of a fun a fun thing to do. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep it to a tight 90 as always. It'll be a short, it'll be a one act. It'll be fun. <laughs> Um, but with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to talk about remote control for Arduinos, and specifically, we're going to talk about uh, infrared remote control. So we're not talking about um, RC car type remote controls, or like remote control airplanes that go over radio waves. We're talking infrared light controls. Um, so if I can get this to respond, there we go. We're talking about controlling your Arduino with a remote, controlling remote controlled things with an Arduino, and a little bit about hex. So we're going to use some hexadecimal numbers tonight, um, which we, we touched on briefly last week and a couple of weeks ago. We're not going to get super deep into it, but I, I want to just give you a brief overview of it just when you see 
um, these weird numbers that have letters in the middle of them, they're not scary, they're just functional. Um, this is not going to be the night where we go deep into like binary and hex and all that stuff. I just want to give you like a glancing blow of hexadecimal so you know um, what you're looking at. So uh, this is not a slides heavy night, I should say. Like I, I know after a couple weeks ago, we were like, let's get back to the table and we certainly will. Um, I just want to show you a couple of quick diagrams um, before we dive in tonight. Um, so quick refresher, infrared, infrared light more, you know, to be specific, is just like light, but a little bit longer. Um, so uh, visible light occupies the frequency spectrum of uh, electromagnetic radiation from, you know, 400-ish to 700-ish nanometers. Um, at the 900 to uh, tens of thousands of nanometers range, you have this infrared range of electromagnetic radiation. So the range that we're going to be talking about tonight, like the specific wavelengths that we're going to be using, are sort of just outside of the visible range. So for all intents and purposes, in terms of how they're acting in space, it's going to behave like light. Um, so it doesn't bend around corners. The further away you get, the dimmer your, your signal, your light is. Um, when you're thinking about intuition for using infrared, signals, they behave like light. It just happens to be light that our eyes can't see, but quite a few cameras actually can. Um, and we may, I think we should take a look at that later tonight. It's going to be a little bit cumbersome because I'm going to have to make it really dark in here, um, but we'll see if we can get you to see some infrared light through a camera. Um, yeah, so this is um, it's a, a picture I stole from the internet. Um, infrared light, we use it specifically because our human eyes can't see it, um, but a lot of camera sensors um, though, of course, they're optimized to pick up light in the visible spectrum so that they absorb the light that we actually want to see in a picture at the far end, they're not perfectly, uh, let's say, cut to exactly the frame, uh, the range of visible light that humans can see. So a lot of cameras, especially the camera in your phone, can actually see a little bit into the infrared range of light. This turns out to be a really easy way to check if your remote control is outputting anything or not, is to turn off all the lights and point the phone on your camera at it, and you should see uh, a little um, a little purple or a little red blink um, that shows you that the, that the camera on your phone is seeing the remote control working. Little pro tip. This actually served me really well. Um, I found out in my experiments um, for, for this week, this is the, <laughs> this is the old remote um, for the TV that's behind me here, this old RCA style remote. Um, it is broken. Um, I pointed my camera at it and got no output at the end. And then actually I did some more destructive things to it too and sort of confirmed that it's, it's busted. But um, that was sort of my first place I went. It was like, well, if it's outputting signal, that would be a very good sign. Um, it doesn't seem like it is, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's in a different frequency. Maybe there's something I'm not understanding. Turns out it doesn't work. Um, by contrast, I had a while where I wasn't sure if the DVD remote control was working. Um, so the first thing I did was point my, my phone's camera at it and I saw the blinks coming out. So I know, ah, at least it's producing signal. Something must be, either must be wrong on my end or I'm not understanding something here. It's like a really easy go, no go um, methodology. Mm. Yes, we got the DVD screensaver going behind us here. I guess I never turned Sean off. We'll bring him back a little bit later. Mm. Maybe the bench slot down for this. Oh, yes, Michael. Thank you. Yes, I should take the bench shot. I should take this camera, <laughs> this camera down for the slides. Um, Chris says there's no batteries. Yeah, well, uh, Chris, you're actually, you're incorrect. There are batteries. Um, they're just hiding in the back here. Um, this actually, the, the battery... Uh, these little tabs in the PCB here stick up into the battery compartment there and actually are the tabs that the positive and negative ends of the battery chain would come into. So, so there. <laughs> it's not that I'm just forgetting to apply power again, although that seems to be the most common cause of errors around here. Um, <laughs> but no, that is well, well and truly busted. Hence why we're going to control the DVD player and not the TV tonight. Um, cause I, I can't figure out uh, what the codes for that remote are. Anyway, to come back to the computer with no bonus camera this time, um, so the pieces that we're going to be using, the components that we're going to use to make our things happen tonight are very simple. We have an infrared LED, an IR LED, and we have this IR receiver module. The IR LED is a lot like the visible light LEDs we've been working with for a few weeks. The IR receiver module is not. Um, so there are devices out there that are meant to receive infrared. They're called IR photodiodes. They're 
we talked a little bit about diodes a couple weeks ago. You remember a diode is a, a thing that passes current only in one direction and not in the other direction. And a photodiode is um, treated in such a way that it only starts to conduct or it conducts more when light falls upon the diode itself. And in this case, specifically IR light makes it through that sort of black looking coating on the outside of the photodiode here. And that causes it to conduct more. And then you can do things with that. You know, I, I've seen more current, so more IR light is falling on me. Um, this is the kind of module you see these in really commonly at a hobbyist level. All this is is an infrared LED next to this uh, IR diode, and you use it as a distance sensor. You have this IR beam coming out and an IR sensor sitting next to it. And you say, oh, well, if I'm seeing the amount of IR that I'm receiving increase, there must be an object coming toward me that's bouncing that IR back to the sensor, right? So that's an IR photodiode, just sort of like, is there or is there not IR light? Slightly different from what we're going to be using tonight, which is this IR receiver, which is a three terminal device. Um, and the reason that they're different um, is that the infrared signals that most remote controls use are modulated. And that means that rather than simply turning on and off the LED to represent a series of ones and zeros to communicate data between the remote control and the endpoint device, we're actually sending a signal which turns on and off many thousands of times per second. If we see the presence of that alternating signal, that modulated signal, that represents either a one or a zero. And when we see the absence of that modulated signal, that's the other state. Sometimes modulated is logic one, sometimes modulated is, is logic zero. So that's apologies if that's a little bit, a little bit messy. Um, but part of the reason for this is that you wouldn't necessarily want, um, let's say your DVD player to think that it's receiving ones and zeros anytime it just sees IR light turn on and off because a lot of things make IR light. Uh, the fluorescent lights, incandescent lights, the sun, and you wouldn't want someone's hand passing between the light source and your sensor to change the amount of infrared light that's present and that to be interpreted as a series of ones and zeros as those shadows go past. So by using this modulated signal, we're only going to detect the presence of a signal when we have an IR uh, a bit of IR light present that's oscillating, turning on and off at this thousands of times per second rate. The typical rate that you see in most, I think it's fair to say most IR senders and receivers these days, is about 38 kilohertz, so turning on or off about 38,000 times a second. You also will see 36 and 40 um, in some old RCA TVs I learned, it's 56 kilohertz, um, but mostly we're looking at 38. A lot of them are roughly cross compatible, like the, you know, the, the tolerance in a 38 kilohertz receiver is usually good enough that if you're sending at 36 or 40, it will basically work as long as your, your protocol, your actual ones and zeros are appropriate. Um, so if you're looking to buy one of these modules and it says 38 kilohertz IR receiver module, um, you are in the right place. Sometimes you see them just on their own, like in a package like this. Sometimes they're started to a little circuit board. They're usually the same thing. Um, so just to drive home the point of how this is actually working. Um, so we have this IR, uh, we, this IR diode here. That's this little LED here. We have a signal that's turning on and off very quickly coming from the computer. That's turning that IR LED on and off, on and off, on and off. Out of the far end, we have this demodulation circuitry that's seeing, okay, do I have this rapidly oscillating IR signal present? I do, that's gonna be one logic state. When I stop seeing that signal, that'll be my other logic state. In this case, we can see our demodulator is sending its output low when it's seeing the signal and high when it's not. It, it may vary based on implementation. And actually, for the things we're doing tonight, we're actually gonna kind of abstract away whether we're looking at low or high. We're gonna sort of, you know, use some libraries to help us decode all of a lot of these things for us. Um, but just so you have a sense of what's going on in the background, that you can't just, you know, take an IR flashlight and flicker it on and off really fast by hand to make these things work. Um, I mentioned protocols. There are lots of different formats for how you communicate data between a remote control and an endpoint device. Do not worry about any of this because I'm going to show you how to figure out what protocol your remote speaks or your device speaks um, and how to um, take that information and implement it into your code. Essentially copy and pasting um, from a, a, a program that decodes what your remote is speaking and putting that into your program for you. I just want you to be aware that there are lots and lots of different formats. So if you are 
uh, say, trying to make use of a an OEM remote or remote from an actual device and it doesn't seem to be working properly, make sure that you're sending uh, your codes or receiving the codes in the proper format or decoding them in the proper format. Because if you don't, it often not only will like not the wrong thing happen, but often nothing will happen. Um, so, like I say, this is a big scary image, um, but it, uh, it's just to say the, things are organized in all kinds of different ways. So we'll, we'll see how to take care of that. So I'm going to take a quick look at the questions and comments, and then we'll dive into our first circuit. See, that's, that's like, I don't know, nine of the 12 slides tonight. I told you it wasn't going to be a super slide heavy night. Um, let's see. Why would you leave batteries in NFG stuff? Uh, well, it turns out the stuff went NFG with batteries in it, and you gotta put new batteries in it to test it, Chris. What's the pot on the setup for? Chris, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Oh, uh, were you referring to the LCD module, I think? I think you were looking at this guy. Yeah, was that what you're referring to? That's the contrast adjust pot for that LCD screen. That's adjust the, the visibility of the, the symbols on that display. The pot on the IR distance module. Yeah, you can, so you can turn up up and down sensitivity on some of them. Um, let's see. Oh, you're talking about this. I understand now. Thank you. Yes, for some of them it's sensitivity. Um, for some of them it's a threshold. Um, some of these modules when you buy them are meant to say, you know, is there an object within 12 inches of me? If so, take a digital pin and send it from low to high or vice versa. Some of them are analog output that says, you know, if I'm um, seeing no IR reflected, send out zero volts. If I'm seeing, you know, as much IR as I can possibly expect, put out some analog two volts or two and a half volts, something like that. And that pot could be used to adjust either the digital threshold voltage or the analog um, scaling um, or sensitivity in that way. I'm not sure what module this is. I stole this image from a random listing on Amazon. So, um, but there's a couple of different types out there. Um, why don't we just jump? Oh, you're over here. Hi. Um, why don't we just jump right into uh, our circuit tonight and we'll play around with some stuff. Um, yeah, it's going to be a good time. And like I said, there's, there really is all the slides. We're going to do a lot of hands-on stuff. Um, there's going to be some stuff that we do live um, and uh, finish writing some code and test some things. So if you have questions or things you want to see done, we'll give it a shot. Did I hear what anyone's drinking tonight? I don't think so. Chris, you teased me with telling me you were buying beer. Did you ever get it? Mm, I want to know. All right. So our receiving circuit is very simple. Uh, we have a three terminal device in this IR receiver. Uh, two of its pins get power and ground, and the third pin is your signal line, which you can attach to any digital input on your Arduino. Um, I'm not going to give you a diagram for which pin is which on your receiver, because it varies uh, a bit between reception modules, especially if you end up with the kind that's soldered to a circuit board, which is what I have tonight. The order will be something that you have to and that you should look up and verify. But basically all of them have a 5 volt pin, a ground pin, and a signal pin. So you wire those up to 5 volts and ground and a signal pin of your choice. In my case, it's going to be on pin 2. So let's look at that quickly on the table. You notice I actually have both my transmission and receiving circuits on the same uh, bit of uh, breadboard tonight just for ease. So we can ignore that half of things for now. We'll just look at this half. So this is my little IR receiver module. And I realize it's hard to see something that's black on black. Um, but this is the actual little module itself, the little dome there. It's my little module. It just started to the circuit board, so it just comes out to these nice pin headers. This is just what came in my, uh, in my kit. If you have the little free-floating ones, they will work exactly the same way. Um, there's a little, there's a little resistor on there, but that's not particularly necessary. Ah, let's see. Lee's got Drumroll Hazy IPA from Odell. Ooh, and Oberon for, ooh, nice, having a, a savory evening. That's really good. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's literally all there is to the circuit. I've got my, my sensor here wired up to ground and five volts and this long dangly signal wire coming over to pin two over here. And that's all we're going to play with for now. So let's come over to the computer and we'll look at a little code. Um, let's see, why don't we start with, so I should say as, as always, um, all the code for tonight is either on or referenced on the website, jeff.glass slash electronics bash, go to episode eight, it'll all be there as well as a copy of all these slides. Um, a lot of what we're going to do tonight is actually just going to make use of the example code that comes with the infrared library that we're making use of tonight. And that is IRLib2. There are basically three infrared libraries that have seen significant use over time. There was, I think, Arduino Remote was the first one. Then there was IRLib. Then there was IRLib2. Um, IRLib and IRLib2 have the same author. They are not 
cross compatible. Um, it's not like you took a Windows 98 program and you're running it on Windows XP. Um, they've changed some of the function names and some of the variable names. So you can't actually just take code that was written for IRLib and run it in IRLib2. IRLib2 is noticeably better. So if you're starting with this from scratch, you should go and download and install IRLib2. And if you uh, don't remember from, gosh, four or five weeks ago um, when we looked at how you install libraries, let me give you a quick refresher. Um, so I, it's called IRLib2. I just Googled it because <laughs> I don't remember where it lives. I ah, hear it is IRLib2, library for receiving and decoding and sending. Great. All I'm going to do in the upper right hand corner here, oh, get rid of that again. Get out of here. Yeah, I'm going to click this clone or download button and download, download the zip file that I'll download to my computer. Um, and then in my Arduino IDE, I'll open any sketch. I'll come to my sketch folder. I'll do include library up at the top in my sketch menu here, and I'll hit add zip library. And then I'll just select that zip file and it will automatically import it into the Arduino IDE and include it in my sketch. If I ever want to include it in another sketch, like let's say I had just a blank sketch here, I'm gonna start playing with, I, with the IR in, I'm gonna go to my sketch menu, go to include library, and I'm gonna have a list of, oops, all the libraries I have available. Let's go down to IRLib2. Now, as we'll see in a little bit, IRLib2 has a lot of stuff in it. Um, you can see here, IRLib2, IRLib2 all, decode base, globals, receive base. So if you don't necessarily, if you're doing something that's say only transmitting or only receiving, or it, let's say what we're gonna do tonight, only sending Samsung encoded signals or only decoding Samsung encoded signals, then uh, you don't need all of the parts of IRLib2. Um, there are ways of including this in other smaller chunks um, that will save you some space. Now. For the, the examples that we're going to do, and for most basic programs, you don't really need to worry about program space. Um, but if you ever run into issues with program space, you can just know that there are ways to slice and dice this. And the examples that come with the IRLib2 library have some pretty neat ways of doing that. So um, just put that in the back of your brain. It's like, oh no, I've run out of program code. Maybe I can pare my IRLib library down. So that's how you include a library into your sketch if you, if you haven't looked at it before. And the first uh, sketch we're going to look at comes with the IRLib library. It's called the dump example. Um, all it's going to do is read in code from, re read in the code from the IR receiver and try to decode it with all of the decoders that IRLib knows about. And it knows about a fair number. In fact, I think on the website here um, on GitHub, which is a super cool website, which we should talk about reading a little bit later. Um, if we come into their protocols folder, I just want to show you. Let's go into IRLibProtocols.h. We can see we have NEC, which is a very common one. In fact, I think the little derpy remote that we're going to be playing with tonight that uh, that came with everything is NEC. Sony, Panasonic, JVC, Sam. It knows a lot of different decoders and it covers a lot of ground. So this code is literally going to include all the possible ways it knows about of decoding a signal and try and figure out what you're sending it. So um, the code itself is really straightforward. Um, you're going to declare a new uh, receiver object, this IR receiver PCI, uh, give it a name and uh, give it the pin that your receiver is attached to. And then you'll create a decoder object. And a little later on, we'll actually create uh, objects that are a little bit more specific that um, are specific to Samsung or NEC or Sony. Um, but um, this is just a generic receiver that's going to decode everything, right? So we declared our objects. Uh, we're going to start up our serial console so we can send commands back and forth. Um, the, it's, it's this bit of code here, it's gonna wait two bonus seconds when we boot it up because a Leonardo, which is a specific kind of Arduino port, takes a little bit longer to boot up, and this is generic code. We're gonna do this myreceiver.enableirin command, which says, hey, start listening for signals, and when you see them, start storing them in your database so we can start uh, seeing what's there. Um, and then when all that is set up, we're gonna send a, a bit of a sentence to the serial console, says, ready to receive IR signals. Thanks, Arduino. And then our loop is literally four lines long. All it's going to say is, you know, every time we go through the loop, if my receiver has results ready for me to look at, I'm going to ask my decoder to decode them. I'm going to dump the results to the serial console. And this dump results just, you know, defaults to going to your serial console. So it'll send that information back to you. And then we need to, once we've dumped everything, we need to re-enable our IR in. Um, so let me just show you what that looks like. So let me make sure I've got everything plugged in plugged in we'll double check i know everyone's like oh check the com port check the from adreno uno uh, i think we I think we may have got it all right tonight for the first time <laughs> so we'll upload that and there i mean there's nothing really to see on the table here i'm gonna point a remote at things and uh and hit 
hit, hit a button. Um, so let's take a look more at the computer. Let's, get, uh, let's leave that open for now, but I'm gonna open my serial monitor. Remember, that's the, the screen that's gonna show us the serial, the text data coming back from the Arduino to the computer. So you can either do that by going to the tools menu and going to serial monitor, or you can do control shift M on a Windows machine. Um, I've figured out how to zoom it in so we can hopefully see it a little better than we have in the past, although still can't zoom in on this input part up here when that becomes important later. Sorry, I'll narrate it as best I can. Let's clear this out. I'm going to reset my Arduino so we can see things from scratch. So that's going to take a second to think about what it's doing. Boot up. Now we see ready to receive IR signals. There we go. So I'm going to take my little remote. So, so I should say my IR receiver and my remote came from Micro Center. They are... Uh, this IR receiver with remote brand. There are a thousand different manufacturers and makers of exactly the same thing. In fact, hilariously, as I was digging through to find uh, the remote that came with this IR controlled candle that we'll have a look at later, this is the remote that came with that candle. This is the remote that came with that IR module. They are literally exactly the same. Um, these things are a dime a dozen and super cheap. Um, you can get them from, from China for nothing or locally for really not very much. So anyway, this is the remote we're gonna be playing with tonight because it's what came with this device. And we'll move on to looking at the fancy remote a little bit later on when we bring Sean back. So over here, I'm still ready to receive IR signals. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna press, uh, let's just press the top left button on my display, this channel minus button. We'll just go there. And we'll see we get a whole bunch of stuff coming back. So here's what it's showing you. And I'm going to point out what the things you actually need to know about. Um, it says I have decoded, decoded NEC1. Remember I said there were a lot of different protocols with these remote speak? Well, this means that the decoder has recognized that this is an NEC formatted signal um, with a value of this number, FFA25D. That is a number in hexadecimal, which I told you we'd get to tonight, with an address of zero. Um, NEC formatted uh Remotes typically don't have any address at all. In fact, you don't really need to send them. Um, but other formats, like the Samsung remote, do take an address. So if you had multiple devices responding to similar commands, presumably there'd be a way to say my DVD player and my VCR and my 8-track player and my Laserdisc player all have different addresses. So I can sort of, with some way on the remote, tell it which device should be listening to what, potentially, right? And then, and this is what's really cool, down below all of that header business, we get all of the individual raw samples for uh, how long the LED was, uh, the, the signals were on and off for and with what periods um, and what delays in between them. Um, we, we get a little bit of a sense of like how long the minimum mark time and space time is. Mark is um, a name that we give to a logic one state and space the name we give to a logic zero state um, just to avoid calling them one and zero or high and low um, because it may change between protocols. But in this case, we can see our mark was always about 550 microseconds. I think it must be microseconds. Um, and space uh, was between, you know, 500 and 1600 microseconds. This is all super cool and it's fascinating um, and will be useful if you have a remote that you cannot decode. But for the purposes of tonight, everything that we really need to know is up here in this line. It's an NEC formatted signal and it has this value FFA25D. Let me hit another button and I'll, we'll learn something else. I'm going to hit the next button on my remote. This is the channel select button here get a bunch more data. I scroll back up here. We got another NEC1 sample with value FF629D. And if I hit change the next button, I get a value of FFE21D. So there, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason to the values that these remotes are putting out. They're kind of discrete per button of the remote. But most of the time, they will be consistent per button on the remote. So let's say that for very first button was FFA25D. If I press it again, I should get FFA25D, right? So I know that when I see the signal FFA25D from my remote, it means that the user has pressed this channel minus button. And similarly for all the other buttons on the remote. Right, all of them have a discrete value that they uh, that they emit and that's picked up by the receiver and slurped into the Arduino. Cool. So now that we have uh, that value, what can we do with it? Well. Um, let's, we, we can sort of do whatever we want. Um, let's open another example and have a look. What do we want to do? Hmm. No, well, we can actually probably build something interesting off of this example. So, um, cause I, I think we'll have a, a funner time writing some code, uh, on our own. So we'll use our, um, we'll use our built-in LED on the device. Um, so I'm going to say, uh, write a little bit of code live here. We'll say pin mode. 
um, LED built-in, which remember is a, a stand-in variable for the LED that's on the board for Arduino. It's usually on pin 13 for the Uno and the Micro and things, but others have it on other pins. Uh, I'm gonna configure that as an output. Um, and then down in my, uh, in my loop here, I'm going to say, I'm gonna do something with the results of my decode. So I'm still gonna dump them, still gonna re-enable, but I'm gonna say, um, if my decoder dot decode equals, um, and we'll we'll use that number that we just saw on the serial monitor, which I think I just blew away. So I have to pull it back up here. So we'll restart our code here. I'll send, I'm gonna say, um, let's do this. If I press the zero button, I want uh, the LED to turn off. If I press the one button, I want it to turn on. So the zero button there is going to have value FF6897. Um, and so I'm gonna write that into my code like this, zero X FF6897. This zero X in front of the number tells us that it is a hexadecimal number and should be read as such. And all that hexadecimal is in a decimal system of numbers, right? Uh, you have a number like uh, 149, right? And that number 149, and this is probably a review from high school algebra for most of you, but forgive me. Um, really what we're saying is we have nine ones, four tens, and one 100 to make up this number. Each of these places represents a ones, a tens, and a hundreds, ones, tens, and a hundreds, which are successive powers of 10, right? So what we say is we're operating in base 10. Every successive digit represents one additional higher power of 10. All that, uh, we've seen a little bit about binary, right? We had numbers that were represented with ones and zeros. That's operating in base two. This first digit still represents ones. The next digit represents the number of twos. We need to make up the, the, uh, the number. Next digit is the number of fours, eights, sixteens, and so on. So one, two, fours, fours place, eighth place, sixteenth place, and so on. Powers of two. Um, and because we're working in a powers of two system, we only need two symbols. We need a zero and a one. We don't need to have a two here because we have a two's place to hold it, if that makes sense. The hexadecimal system is base 16, right? So if we had a number like, uh, let's say 149 again, that represents uh, nine units, nine ones, four 16s, and one 256. Um, each place is an additional multiple of 16 above the place before it. And because we have 16 different um, values working in base 16, we need 16 symbols to hold it. So we have our digits one through nine, those are great. Um, so we need six more symbols to represent ten, what we would call 10, 11, 12, and so on. And so we typically use A, B, C, D, E, and F, A, B, C, D, E, and F to represent uh, the ideas of zero through 15. And then 16, in, what we would call 16 in hexadecimal, is one zero, one sixteen, and no ones, right? So it's it's another way of representing numbers. And what's nice about it is we used it a couple weeks ago because we were working with numbers in binary um, that get quite long quite fast because a binary number is not a super efficient way to write a number composed of ones and zeros. You can wrap up that same information into hexadecimal and that number just becomes a lot shorter. Um, so it's a very condensed way of representing a long string of ones and zeros. Um, so rather than giving us this code that for our zero key here as a string of ones and zeros, which is what the decoder is seeing, it's saying, hey, let's wrap that all up into just a few hex numbers that are easier to read and easier to rewrite. That's all the text is. Another way of writing numbers to condense um, the way of, of writing information that's coming to us often as ones and zeros into a smaller amount of space, right? That's all the hex we're gonna get into this evening. I just don't want you to be scared of zero X anything, mostly because we're just gonna be copying that value out of the serial monitor all night. So don't worry about it too much. Oh, let's hide that again. Um, so um, I'm gonna say if my decoder to code, so if my decoder results are equal to this number, which I said matches the zero key, I'll do an if block and I will say uh, digital right uh, LED built in low. I'll turn that LED off. Else if my decoder dot decode. I'm actually not 100% sure that this is the right syntax. So if it's not, um, I'll have to go and check it in a sec here, but that'll be fun. We'll learn something together. I'm gonna press the one key here and the value for my one key is FF30CF. Uh, else if decode FFC0, what I say? CF? CF, right? Digital right LED built in, built lin, built in. Hi, right? 
Um, we're still going to have it dump the results to the serial port and we'll re-enable that IR later. Um, I think this is the right code. I'm going to have to save this real quick. We'll call this our dump examples. Um, and we will upload that code and see what happens. I'm actually not sure. The part, the part I'm not sure about is this, if my decoder.decode is right or if I need to store that result in a variable and then, and then compare it later. I guess we'll see. So let's come to the table here. And we'll see here. Yeah, I think something is not quite right there because I can see I'm dumping results to the serial console, but I'm not getting my built-in LED to turn on. So I must have something wrong with my syntax here. That's all right. Um, let me see. I'm going to jump ahead to a feature example and see how I did it. We'll get to all this later. No spoilers. Um, let's see. I'm going to do DVD control example I wrote earlier. Uh, da, da, da. That's a sending example. What's a receiving example? Here we go. Decode. My decode value is what I want. Yes. So um, I need to first do my decoder dot decode. Um, and then I'm going to do this my decoder dot value variable that it's providing for me, which is the value that it's actually decoded. So, oops. That um, that syntax, my decoder.value, is something I stole from another of the examples that the irlib2 library gives you. So that's pretty nice. A lot of the times, these these libraries, the ones that get really well used, have excellent examples. Always a good place to start. I mean, this is a decent place to start, but the examples in the IDE, a better place to start. Let's be real. So come back to the table here. I'm just going to shade that, hopefully. Still not happening. Let's take a look. This will be good. We can do a little troubleshooting together. Let's see what's happening in our serial console here. So I'm going to need to clear this out, I think. Let's reopen that. I think it's just run off the screen a little bit here. There we go. I'm ready to receive IR signals. I'll press my zero button and my one button. Let's see here. What is happening? So I was, that's funny. I was looking, I have two monitors here. I was looking at the one on the stream. It doesn't make any sense here. So, um, if value, let's just make sure that I'm getting this syntax correct here. Uh, from here's my example. Chat button to do display. And then here, if my decoder dot decode, if my decoder dot value. Yeah, let's see. Let's see, I guess I will wrap this all in another if block to make sure it actually decodes properly. You guys, one of the things that I'm sort of like playing with as we're evolving, you know, this, we're in week eight of these fundamentals of Arduino streams, and I'm pretty sure that the pendulum swung too far in the direction of just reading code at y'all a couple of weeks ago. But I'm trying to swing back in the direction of actually like doing something, you know, uh, on stage, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and, um, like finding ways to make that engaging and interesting. Um, so uh, this may be a little bit too far in the other direction where the thing isn't actually working, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, but let's see here. It's funny, if we'll, get, if we'll, we'll get to the later example where it does work, where I'm actually controlling the RGB LEDs with a remote control, which I tested in advance because that's a pretty good idea. Um, let's see. And that will work just fine, I know. I think we're talking value Y, value equal equals. I'm not sure why this isn't working, to be perfectly honest. Hmm. It's not a particularly complicated sketch, is it? If that value is equal to that other value. Anyone see something I'm doing that's dumb, you please let me know. Um, LED built in low, LED built in high. I'm not overloading pin 13. I guess we could try just making that a hard pin 13. This is sort of like the debugging process in a nutshell. Like, okay, I'm trying to be clever and fancy here. Why? Maybe I tried to do too much at once. Maybe I'm trying to be a little too fancy. Um, <laughs> Ken says the dirty secret of this hobby is spent trying to figure out how it didn't work. Yeah, it's true. It's funny, like, there's some ways in which I don't think it would be particularly uh, riveting, but I feel like the parts of this where I'm actually building the demos from scratch might be the more educational, if more boring part of it. It was like, getting this to work, like, just a half an hour ago, this was not transmitting anything. Um, I was like, why? Why isn't that transmitting? That's super weird. And there was actually kind of an interesting debugging process, at least interesting for me, but I think kind of tedious to watch somebody struggle through something for 25 minutes um, on a stream. So we probably won't go that far in that direction. Let's see here. Well, now it's not doing anything. Now I'm not even sending. Am I sending to the right Arduino? I do have two Arduinos hooked up. No? That's so bizarre. Let's open that. Yeah, I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. 
if I've broken something. I mean, clearly I've broken something. Um, hmm. Well, that's a bit of a bummer. <laughs> well, why, why don't we charge ahead to the example I know works, which has this exact same syntax in it, and we'll figure out later on, like, what what is he doing? What did he, why did he screw up there? How bizarre. Um, <laughs> we'll jump ahead to um, an example that's kind of going to build on a thing we did last week, which is we were looking at a circuit which made use of an LCD screen. Let me get this out of the way for a second here. We'll bring this guy in. Some of you remember our fun, the fun that we had with our LCD screen here, where it was uh, not suiting super right into this uh, into this breadboard. It kept falling out, making all kinds of satanic weird characters. That might happen again. I'm having better luck this week, but not perfect luck. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. Let's zoom this out just a little bit here. Get it out of the glare. There we go. So this is going to be uh, our first example that we do with our uh, RGB LED remote. So Remember the example last week or two weeks ago um, was just to um, demonstrate how to use an LCD screen. So we had this LCD screen, we had uh, three different values here, and we used two buttons to sort of go from red to green to blue and increment those individual values. And that's all that we decided we were going to do with that. Oops, why are you not uploading now? Boisha, boish. Let's upload that. Upload? Good. Um, so... This week, we're going to do the same thing, except instead of using buttons, which are old-fashioned and slow, we're going to use a remote that happens to have red, green, and blue colored buttons already on it to make our lives a little bit easier. And we're going to do it in a couple of steps. I just want to show you the operation of this guy, which hopefully hopefully still works. Man, we're 0 for 1 already tonight. Um, and and uh, then we will go ahead and go uh, to a more advanced result. And both times, I'm going to show you the code, which you can use as a way to start thinking about how you break down control using remotes. So let's see here. That's pretty visible there. Um, so the way I've laid this out is rather than using a button to go back and forth between the red, green, and blue positions, um, I have gone, oops, yeah, I thought that's what happened. There's supposed to be a blinking cursor in this example, and uh, there wasn't, which tells me that the board had come unplugged. Oof. Shades of last week, y'all. Reset. Reset, re-upload, my goodness. This is, I think, why people do YouTube videos instead of live streams, because you can build this all in advance. Oh, you know what it is? I changed the wiring on this later, I bet. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, I changed the wiring on it. I changed one of the wires that controls the LCD from pin seven to pin nine because my LED control had a conflict with the LCD screen. We can talk about that later too. Somebody remind me to talk about conflicts with the uh, IR library. Anyway, Kenneth, not now. Remind me later. <laughs> I know you were thinking it. So here is going to be the gist of our code, hopefully, if it works. You can see down here I have a little cursor below the one on this uh, this red selection here. Um, and in fact, if I turn on my cursor functionality, and my blink functionality, you might be able to see that a little better, I'm reading. So you remember from our LCD lesson last week? Last Was it just last week? Um, that if you use this cursor command, you get a visible cursor. If you use this blink command, the cursor will blink at you. See, I'll we'll come back over here. You'll see this blinking cursor. That's going to be easier for us to see tonight, I think. So right now I have my red parameter selected. Um, and I've decided that by using the first red, green, and blue buttons here should move my, uh, my cursor to the red, green, and blue positions. And then for a very simple startup control example, my 0, 100, and 200 buttons here should set the corresponding values to 0, 100, and 200. So if I press my green button here, come on. Oh, <laughs> you know what's not on this circuit board? The IR receiver. It's on the other circuit board. Hang on a sec. I'm going to take just a moment. I'm going to hook it all together. Certainly helps if everything's plugged in, huh? I'm going to unplug the Arduino from the computer to do this. Thankfully, there's a nice big LCD screen staring me in the face, so it'll be obvious when I forget to plug it back in later. Plug that in. Plug in this. This will go back to pin 2. This is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I will say, so the IR receiver can go on basically any digital pin. The IR transmitter, though, cannot. Um, there are specific pins that it is tied to because of the way it's tied into the Arduino's hardware. Um, so just something to be aware of as you're uh, planning out your pin layouts for your projects. All right, that's better. Now we're all wired up. Let's plug the Arduino back in. All right, now we're back. 
<laughs> what's ha what's getting what's getting sa sassy and if you go get sassy in the chat uh alex he's the electronics kiki yeah projects that always work do you really how much do you learn from projects that always work i know i learn more when things don't work the first time mm. yeah we're um i see the lcd for those who are naysaying my lcd screen look how beautiful it is it's working it's working so great but don't spook it <laughs> don't scare it too badly because it uh it may fall apart at any moment. All right, so as I was saying, now that our IR decoder is hooked up, and hopefully this works, if I press my green button, yeah, we move over to the green selection. If I press my blue button, I move over to the blue selection, and so on. So I now have color select of which color I'm selecting. This is like the first thing that's gone right tonight, like other than the slides. <laughs> so I, I'm, hang on. I think we had a thing a couple weeks ago where we drank every time something went wrong. Or we, maybe we, I drank every time something went wrong. Um, tonight we're drinking for things that go right. So cheers. Uh, I know I say this every week, but this Ironica IPA from Five Rabbit is really very tasty. Thanks, Five Rabbit. Not sponsored, just tasty. All right, so I have these three buttons hooked up to uh, select red, green, or blue on my LCD here. And I have my buttons select uh, my 0, 100, and 200 buttons here do 0. 100 or 200. I could say, oh, I want this to be full red or mostly red because full would be 255. Green should be zero. And uh, I don't know, we'll mix in a little bit of blue there, right? So already this is so much more comfortable and intuitive than using like a button to step over. And then I had a button that only incremented, it never went down. So you had to sort of, if you wanted to decrease an amount of red or green or blue, you had to sort of scroll around through the top back. So this already is a massive improvement. So let's look at the code for this. And then I'm gonna show you the code for a more advanced version that uses all the numbers. So here we are. So this is the code and reminder, the code is all on the website. If you're playing along at home in the present or later, this is the, R the first LCD RGB remote example. So we're here, yeah. Um, so a lot of this will look familiar if you were playing along last week. So uh, we have, let me jump around just a little bit here, but we're using our liquid crystal library again, which takes six control pins, you remember, uh, reset, enable, and four data pins that can be any of the six digital pins I've chosen. 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, for mostly arbitrary reasons. Um, I've had to include a couple of my IR lib pieces. So notice I'm not including that IR lib all that H. I'm only including the decoder piece and this, which is actually the um, just the format that I'm going to use. I, we discovered earlier that this remote uses that NEC format. So I'm just including my NEC format here. I don't need to know how to decode Samsung remotes or Sony remotes or RCA remotes. I just need this one format so I can save some program space and some upload time by doing that, right? Um, like before, um, I'm gonna need this IR receiver. This, um, so it's gonna take a digital pin. In this case, I'm gonna do pin two, and I'm gonna need a decoder. And in this case, you can see again, I'm only using a, an NEC decoder, this IR decode NEC object, instead of my IR decode PCI object that was a sort of general decoder. Um, the way you figure out how you would like what these things are called is look in the examples or steal my code um, and base it from there. Or you can do some sleuthing on GitHub. I think you might take a, a little quick peek at how to sleuth out bits of things from GitHub tonight. Um, not, not super deep, but it was super helpful as I was piecing myself together, <laughs> piecing the projects together tonight and piecing myself together, to be honest. Um, and so I think that might be a, a useful skill for people to have. Um, Skipping down here a little bit. Um, this is all basically the same code we wrote last week to talk about this LCD screen project with some remote control stuff bolted on. So for those who weren't here last week, we're remembering which of three positions that cursor should be pointed at. The, the zero position is all the way to the left. The six is in the middle where that green label is and 12 is to the right where that blue label is. I have three positions. Um, this button increment actually doesn't doesn't do anything anymore. This, uh, this array holds the amounts of red, green, and blue that we're gonna work with. And having them in an array is gonna let this sort of reference them um, more conveniently than having individual variables called like red amount and blue amount and things like that. So we just tuck them together into an array and I made a comment here to remember what order that they're in. Um, this code should all look familiar from last week as well. I'm gonna start up my LCD object with uh, how many columns and how many rows it has. In my case, it has 16 columns in two rows. Um, I'm gonna do this display colors step, which is basically just prints some text to the display, prints all of that text at once to the display. This is basically like, hey, refresh the display for me command. And we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Turn on the cursor, make it blink so we can see it on the camera, um, and then enable my IR receiver, right? Um, and then 
I have done in advance, I have uh, gone into my dump program and I have looked at what are those hexadecimal values for the various keys that I'm interested in using. Um, this here's our, our friend FFA25D that we couldn't get to respond earlier. Um, we have FF22DD is that volume minus key. That was our that was our second here key here, our green key. Um, we have our uh, our minus key was our next one down, and then 0, 100, and 200. So I just I went into the dump program. I said, what are the codes for these? And I copied and pasted them in, in here. Um, and I've used this define syntax, which we've used before, I think. Um, it's very similar to saying, um, let's get int ch minus, which is my name for channel minus, equals OXFFA25D. Um, when you define something in this way, you're not allowed to change it in the middle of your code, but that's fine. We're never going to want to change these values. Um, and for a lot of things, uh, setting up a lot of individual variables with names, sometimes this define syntax is cleaner. There are some specific situations where this is actually more useful um, than defining a variable using that equals syntax, that assignment syntax. But just for tonight, just know that like, oh, uh, the variable ch minus is going to be uh, OX FFA 55D, right? So that's our setup. My loop is real simple. It says, if this check buttons function is true, display colors, which remember is this display colors function just like clears the LCD, prints the labels and prints the values of the colors. It's basically saying, hey, refresh that display for me. So set the cursor to the front, print the red label, print the amount of red, green label, print the amount of green, blue label, print the amount of blue, and then set the cursor back to the position for whichever of those colors I'm selecting at the moment um, so that my user, or that me, can see where the cursor is at this point. So I'm gonna set that cursor to one of my three display positions. Which one? Well, I'm gonna use that cursor index variable, which is gonna be zero, one, or two. Um, to tell me where that cursor should be showing up. Cool. So I said that my function was, if this check button function is display true, then refresh my display. So here's what check buttons does. And this is kind of the meat of the IR control of this program. Wow, we're only 10 minutes in and we're already to the code. It's really great. <laughs> um, so this will look a lot like our receiver example we were trying to get working a moment ago. So if my receiver has results for me to look at, if my receiver.get results, and if my decoder can decode them, then uh, I'm going to use this switch case statement that we looked at uh, last week or, or two weeks ago um, that basically says, hey, I'm going to jump into a bit of code determined by the value of this variable. Um, so if my decoder's value is equal to the value ch minus, um, if it's equal to FFA25D, then run this bit of code and then break tells us to go, okay, well, that's the end of this block. I'm going to jump to the end of this curly brace and move on. If my decoder's value is equal to my volume minus code, do this. Oh, and then break and we'll jump out as well. Uh, if, I, if it's equal to my minus code, uh, do this and so on. And you can see for my first three buttons, my red, green, and blue buttons, I'm just changing the index of my cursor. So my cursor index is zero or one or two, and that tells my cursor where to be. Um, if I press my 0 or 100 or 200 buttons, then I'm changing the color associated to the current position of that cursor, right? So let me bring this back up for just a second here. If I press my vol minus button, right? Press my vol minus button, I set my cursor index to 1. You might be able to, ah, I can see, but the cursor just moved to the green here. And then if I press my 100 button here, you can see I set the value associated with that position of the cursor to 100. Um, so I'm sort of using this, this switch statement to say, hey, for which of these buttons is pressed, here's the code I want to run. I've done this whole switch statement in single lines, but just in case you're, you're newish to switch statements, you can also do um, them in multiple lines like you would do an if-then statement. So I could do, say, if case, let's make up another one, let's say the volume plus button, um, I can do... Uh, serial.print fart, uh, digital write, more fart, et cetera, et cetera, break. Um, and this would be a perfectly valid way to write another part of this switch statement here. Let me zoom in here so you can really enjoy the comedy of writing fart on the internet. Um, so this is a, a perfectly valid syntax. I've just, for cleanliness, I've kept them all to one line here because they're only doing one thing. Um, you, If you don't put this break statement in, 
here's what will happen. Let's say if I was to omit that break, um, when I pressed my CH minus button, my decoder value would have that FFA2 D5 value, right? I would jump into this case CH minus, I would set my cursor index to zero, but nothing's telling me that I should be done. So I actually just run the next line of code, set the cursor index to be one, and then I break out of it. So it's important most of the time in your switch case statements, you wanna have this break at the end that tells you, hey, that's the end of that case, move on to the next thing. Cool. So. Uh, this is my check buttons function, right? It's saying, uh, do something based on these six buttons pressed. And by the way, if this value is equal to something else, if I press some other button, ain't nothing gonna happen. We check all these cases, none of them match, and we just move on without doing anything. Also totally valid. Um, and then at the end, we enable IR in, um, just to re-enable our IR receiver. And then if I was able to decode the results, um, I wanna return a true value. Cause remember we're using this up here to say, hey, if this check buttons function returns true, I need to update my display. So if I decoded something, hey, I need to update my display. But if, if I did not decode any interesting results, that's false. Don't worry about updating the display. There's nothing to see here. Nothing can have changed. Cool. That's the gist of that IR remote example. I need a drink of beer. Questions, comments, issues, concerns? Mm. I'm so pleased this is going well. I kind of, I guess, shows the value of um, preparing your examples in advance. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, the, that's what I just want to give me. I do feel kind of redeemed because this LCD module didn't work super well last week for those who, who weren't here. Um, so I feel like we're, we're back on the right track um, and having some things actually actually show up, show up correctly. Mm. Brian asked a good question. Benefits of the switch case to if else. So, um... In switch case here, um, I could just as easily have written this, um, let's say, um, if my decoder dot value, can this be that all right? Yes, let's zoom in a little more. Uh, equal equals ch minus, uh, cursor index equals zero. Else if my decoder dot value equal equals fall minus, and so on, right? I could run this as a series of if-else statements. Um, in this case, a couple of reasons. One is um, just cleanliness, like the, the switch case uh, syntax made this, I think, a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, you also can have some savings if you have a lot of different cases, because of course, in this if-else example, I have to individually check. Uh, if, let's say, you know, I have this, I have the else if dot 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 for the minus uh the minus key example the zero key example the 100 example and so on i have to individually check each of those true or false evaluations um to find out if i need to check the next one let's say i press the 200 button i actually have to evaluate six different truthfulnesses of um of if then statements to get down to my 200s case with this switch case statement um i only i'm evaluating it inside the arduino in a different way so it's a little bit faster in some i would say most situations um for most of our purposes where we're not really stretching the arduino to its limits it's a matter of choice and syntax um there are some cases where we can kind of start to abuse the syntax of um the uh, the switch case statement to do some kind of clever things. And actually the next example is gonna have that as well. So let's jump to that next example. This is gonna be a great segue. I'm so pleased. Um, this will be the RGB remote type example on the website if you're playing along at home. So a lot of it is gonna be exactly the same. I literally just save as the previous program and added some stuff to it. So we're gonna breeze through a few parts of it you just have seen, because we don't need to see them twice. Um, we included our libraries. We initialized our LCD display with the correct pins this time, snatch. Um, we started our receiver and decoder. We have our array of display positions. This is all exactly the same. Ah, and then I have a few variables here that are gonna hold a, um, a sort of a mode that I exist in, whether I'm in the select mode or the type mode. I'm gonna use this mode variable to say, hey, if mode is zero, I'm gonna think of myself as being in select mode and in mode one, be in type mode. And we'll see how we're using that later. Um, and then this sub index variable, I'm gonna use to select individual, excuse me, digits, of those color values to enter digits directly into. So that'll make sense in a second. Um, know that I'm using the mode and sub index variables. All of this is the same. Um, uh, starting up our LCD, I changed the, the name of this function at some point from um, set LED colors, I think, to do display, because that's a more accurate description of what it's doing. 
um, starting my serial console, um, enabling my IR receiver. Um, and then just below it here, I've just, I basically read in all of the values for almost all the buttons on the remote. So I have my friends to minus, of all minus, minus zero, but then I have all of my digits from one through nine as well. And again, this was just going into that dump program that we saw earlier, pointing the remote at the receiver, copying and pasting those values in here and putting OX in front of them, right? So a little bit tedious, but you know, a good way to verify. I wouldn't count even if you bought uh, this exact same kit from Micro Center where I bought mine, I wouldn't expect your remote to have the same codes as mine. So double check yours um, if you're going to try this out at home. Um, so let's see here. So um, one thing I've, I'm going to use to make my life a little bit easier later is I wrote this function called get value of button that basically says, hey, if I see the zero button, I want a way to be able to tell something else in my program that that means the number zero or that means the number one. So I'm not actually doing anything here. This is just kind of a translation table from the button called zero to the digit zero that I'm going to use later on. So I can actually use this to type in some numbers, right? Um, and then I'm using a structure here, which we didn't see a moment ago called default. So I said a moment ago, right, if your, if your variable that you're using for your switch statement doesn't match any of your cases, you just carry on and do nothing. You don't have to do that. You can assign what's called a default case at the end, which says, hey, if I haven't matched with any of the other cases, do this default code. And in this case, I decided that my default return value, if I'm, if I'm uh, trying to evaluate the value of a button that's not one of my 10 digits, hand me back a value of negative 1,000. Really what I wanted here is, I, I, if I'm trying to evaluate the numerical value of, let's say, the EQ button here, which is a hilarious button to have on a tiny, awful remote, um, I want my code to break really fast so I know I've screwed up somewhere. So hand me back this ridiculously large negative value that will pay up. Something will look very wrong and I'll know that I've screwed up the code somewhere. That's all that is. Um, my loop looks very similar. Checking the buttons. If I need to update the display, please do. Um, the display code, very similar. Um, I'm just printing the labels and then printing the numbers, printing the labels, printing the numbers, and so on. Um, I'll come back to print pad in a sec. And so my check buttons code really is the only thing that's changed in any kind of significant way. This is part of the, like, I think I tried to drive home in that kind of dry episode about writing a game of Snake on an Arduino is by encapsulating things into functions um, and having a keen understanding of what each function you've written is intended to do, what sort of contract they're fulfilling in your code, you can rewrite them to do the same thing in a different way or do new things without breaking the rest of your code. So from the point of view of my loop code here, for example, uh, all that this cares about is like, hey, does the check buttons function return true or false? Um, which in my Jeff Glass head, I know, oh, if it returns true, I want to update the display. If it's false, I don't, right? This check buttons function can be doing a lot of different other things. In fact, it doesn't even have to check buttons. It could be relying on the clock on the wall, or it could be relying on um, a joystick or some other sensor, but the rest of this code doesn't know about that. It just knows whether it returns true or false, right? So by wrapping up your, your function, your ideas into functions, you can sort of think about, okay, that's a chunk of code I can change out and not affect anything else. Similarly, this do display function, you know, is built to print to an LCD, but it could also be displaying the values on a, a CRT monitor or on a fireworks control mechanism or anything else. The check buttons function doesn't know anything about the display. It just knows to do something with the buttons and return true or false. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but as you're thinking about what you're, how to build on your code, think about building simple versions of these functions, kind of like we just did, and then expanding on them in ways that don't break the rest of your code. So here's how we've expanded on our check buttons code. Very similar, if I have results and I'm in select mode, things are gonna look pretty similar. Um, I'm gonna do this switch case with my decoder value again, and I've decided that my, my red, green, and blue buttons here, my to minus, vol minus, and, uh, and minus keys here, remember those are my, my red, green, and blue buttons that I'm just using along the side of my display. Um, those are going to do exactly the same thing. Select red, green, or blue. And my 100 and 200 buttons are still going to be shortcuts to turn those on at level 100 or 200, right? So um, that's easy enough. Here's where I'm starting to abuse the switch case syntax, as I mentioned a moment ago, Brian. So notice I had cases 0 through 9 here with nothing after them uh, until we get to case 9. And that means any time I press any of these buttons. So I guess let's say I press the button corresponding to uh, code 3. So my Arduino gets code... Uh, FF7885. So 
All right, so it's gonna come down to the switch case. It's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna jump to three. Well, there's nothing telling me to break, so I better go to the next line of code, and then go to the next line of code, and then go to the next line. And only when we get down to case nine, does something interesting happen. So each of these 10 cases actually does the same thing, which is set the mode to type mode, set the sub index value, which remember I'm using to hold which digit of that value I'm altering. And I'm gonna start blinking my cursor so I can tell that I'm in type mode. Let me show you what I mean. So let's upload that to the table. And again, we'll just hope we haven't broken anything. I'm doing really good about not touching this for the past 10 minutes, um, which I feel pretty good about. So on the surface, things look pretty similar here. I've got my cursor on one um, and I can move it. You can sort of see, move it between red and blue. Get over there. Oops, did I break things again? Oh no. Ooh, I think I got my blue code wrong. That'll be a fun thing for us to troubleshoot together. Um, but here, let me reset this real quick. So we're back to the beginning. So you'll see, I'm just selecting things now, but if I press any of my digit buttons here, like if I press one, you'll see I've entered a one into that first space and my cursor started flashing. That let me know that I'm in type mode now. So I'm using that cursor flash to indicate something to my users at this point. So let's see now that we're in type mode, what is actually happening. So if I go into type mode, remember this was an if statement that said, you know, if the mode is select mode, right? But I'm following up immediately with if this mode is type, right? So either I was in type mode to begin with, or I just said it in this previous is statement. Let's be going to our typing mode where we'll type in the value that we want our, our RG or B to be. And similarly, I'm abusing this, uh, this switch case statement here um, to make all of these cases zero through nine do basically the same thing um, and ignore, importantly, any other button presses. Um, I'm going to get the value of my digit. This is using that function there that said, hey, you know, the six button can be translated to the number six. So let's say, um, what did I do just now? I'll press the two button. So this digit value is going to be uh, have a number called two in it now. Uh, I want the digit of my color to be set to that number two. I've written this set digit function here. I'm not going to dive super deep into it because as we know, math on stream is not super interesting. But if you want to go poke around the set digit function and how we're, you know, saying for a three digit number, you know, give it a number, give it which position you want and what digit you want it to be. This will set that digit to that number. Um, just a bit of math that took, took some working out to do. Similarly, I have a get digit function that says, hey, get me the second digit of this three digit number and this will return it to you. And you can go poke around with those if you want. They're kind of interesting. But all this is doing is saying, hey, um, set the, the current digit of that number to be our new digit value. Then pr uh, display my colors again, please, and go to the next digit of my number. If the next, if we're on our, our number three digit, which is in fact our fourth digit, because remember everything counts from zero in programming. So our hundred digit was the zeroth digit. Then we did our tens digit. We did our ones digit. If we've gone past the end, Here's what I'd like to do. Reset to zero. Um, I wanna make sure that the value I've assigned to my color is between zero and 255 using this constrain function, which is, hey, if this is smaller than zero or bigger than 255, <coughs> lock it in, make it zero or make it 255. Oof, a lot of talking tonight. Ooh. Um, We'll constrain it to a value between zero and 255, and we'll go back to select mode and turn off that blinking cursor so we know that we are done. And then we'll enable our IR receiver and tell our display to update. So looking at that all together on the table here, I'm going to, let's reset as we start again. So let's say I want to alter the amount of green in my display here. I'll press my green button to select green, and let's say I'd like it to be 60. So I'm gonna type in zero, you can see a zero has appeared there and I'm flashing. So I'm in select mode, six and zero. And because my index was greater than three, I went back to select mode, which puts my cursor back in the first spot and I'm ready to, uh, to display again. Um, I can also still use my shortcut keys, right? I still have my 100 and 200 shortcut keys here. Um, and I can also zero things out, zero, zero, zero. And now that green is off. Nice, make sense? Sort of casual. Let's do another example. So if I come over to my blue key here, or I come over to my red over here, um, I can type in the value. Let's type in a value that's too high. Let's type in 280. We'll do 280. And you see it constrained it back to, to 255 um, because I had that constrained function in there, which uh, which locks that value that I, I've been writing into it as between zero and 255. Constrain, 
a super useful thing if you want to keep something in the bounds of what is plausible, especially if you're taking user input from a silly user like myself. Cool. So just a, a <laughs> blue is still broken. Yeah, I guess we're not getting blue today. I wonder why that is. What's interesting to me, I'm, I we could go down a whole troubleshooting rabbit hole, but we're already 20 minutes in. Um, and I have more to talk about tonight, um, so we probably will bypass this. But the blue display is broken, and the blue on the LED is not working. Because I have this little, I don't know if you've seen it, I have this little RGB LED down here. Um, but the blue on that is also not turning on, which tells me something is, like, even more broken somewhere deeper in the code. Or maybe broken in two places? I don't know. Um, if anyone wants to go uh, wire this up and write some code and figure out where I messed things up, or maybe if it was a wiring error, um, you, can, uh, you can do that for me. Ooh, you know what I bet it is? Let's check our pins. Uh, all right, I said I wasn't gonna do this, but I think there's a really obvious fix, which is just that I changed my wiring. Oh no, five, five, six, nine? That doesn't seem right. I'm in three, five, and nine. So this must actually be three, and I think that's gonna be a problem. I think I wanna move that to six. So, oh yeah, it can't be in three because my transmitter's in three. That doesn't sound right. Let's see here. I still don't know why, um, why, <laughs> why, oh, here we are. I still don't know why, um, why, yep, Michael, it was a, is a, is a sarcasm. Because, because, because of these very long. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good sarcasm. I'm getting, uh, okay, I said I wasn't going to get into it. Um, We'll talk, we'll talk about wiring conflicts when we get to transmitters. Kenneth, remind me, not now, but later, we're going to talk about wiring conflicts with the IR library when we get to transmitters, which we should probably just talk about transmitters, huh? The basic receiver demo is as such. You read the values off of your uh, off of your remote with that dump function, you put them into your code, and you use an if-then statement or a switch case statement to decide what to do with those buttons. Capiche? Sweet. <laughs> um, let's, I'm, I'm in a mood tonight, y'all. I'm having a great time. Uh, we'll talk about conflict, Kenneth. <laughs> watching you, I'm watching you here, I'm watching you here. It's gonna be great. Um, let's talk about transmitters. So, let's take a quick look at the transmission circuit that I'm gonna be using tonight. So, um, there is already an error in it, which is that this should be pin D three, pin D three. Um, so. Um, for transmitting, you can use, um, and I encourage you to do just for your testing purposes, just an LED and a resistor. Totally fine. Um, a lot of IR LEDs, interestingly enough, have much higher current limits than visible light LEDs. Um, this is the ones I'm, I'm using tonight. They're just the, the first pack that I pulled out of my LED bin. These happen to be a pack from Adafruit. Um, these can run at 100 milliamps continuous or one amp pulsed which is super cool. Um, so, and a lot of them are like that. I know like the, the kits and, and bags I've bought before are also super high current. So you can run these things at, at really high current if you have the appropriate resistors and you can calculate the appropriate resistors using what we learned in episode four about electricity. I told you it all tied in. So of course we can't pull a whole amp at five volts out of our Arduino. We would need to use something like a FET to drive these LEDs. If you don't know how to use FETs, you could learn about those in a previous episode as well. I think it's episode five. How super cool. So this is the circuit that I'm going to be using tonight to transmit things, partly because I found that 20 milliamps of infrared light wasn't enough to get me from my circuit down on the table here to the DVD player behind me reliably. In fact, sometimes there's occlusion and even the, the 300 milliamps I had to set up for or so wasn't enough to get there. You'll also see, interestingly enough, I'm uh, using two LEDs in series here, um, and that's perfectly fine. Remember from our LED talk, they each have a forward voltage drop, some voltage that's sort of lost to the flow of current in this circuit. Um, and for an IR LED, that's between 1.6 and two volts. You actually, when you run these at high enough current, you run into the fact that that, that um, forward voltage does change somewhat based on the current you're actually putting through the thing. Um, so between 1.6 and 2 volts is sort of the range that they float between, depending on how much current you're putting through them. So I put a 5.6 ohm worth of resistance um, in front of them, and I'm actually using two... 2.7 ohms, we have this 5.4 ohms, two 2.7 quarter ohm resistors because I need to be able to dissipate about half a watt through this resistor based on the circuit they have here. And if you're thinking about how to calculate that, you can either go back and watch the episode on electricity or Google LED calculator and type in your forward voltage values and it will tell you what kind of resistor 
you need. To be honest, that's what I do 99% of the time. <laughs> um, there's lots of good LED calculators out there these days. And then I'm using this N channel FET that we learned about using. Remember, I, I, the FET acts in this case like a switch that either closes or opens. So I'm gonna use the digital pin of my Arduino to either turn the LEDs on by closing this switch or turn the LEDs off by opening that switch. So this, the programming is exactly the same whether you're using this transistor or not. Um, this is gonna give me some more power to do this demo with, cool. So let's look at our sending example. So this is going to be uh, another example straight from the infrared library. So in my examples, we're going to use our send example. Um, and here we are. So the sending from uh, sending to an IR device uh, feels a lot like um, getting information from an IR device. We have a bunch of includes here. Um, this base for sending, the protocols that we want to use. Um, and then you want to use an important step. You want to include this IR lib combo at the very end. It's doing some code in the background that sort of creates a universal sending device for you that sort of makes things easier. We're going to use this IR send object. In my case, I'm going to call it IR sender. And then for this very simple example, um, we're gonna start up our serial console. We'll wait for it to start. And then every time that I have a character available, I'm gonna send the same code. So if, if serial.read is not equal to minus one. So serial.read, remember, is something that sort of takes one character off of uh, the incoming serial information from the computer. If there's not a character to be read, this function hands you back minus one. It says, hey, that, nothing to see here. Minus one, minus one, minus one. If there's something there, when this is not minus one, I want to do something. In this case, I'm not going to do anything with that value. I'm just going to enter into my if statement. I'm going to send, let's zoom in a little, there we go. I'm going to send this Samsung value that I found earlier. Uh, and then I'm going to print a serial statement that says sent signal, um, just so I, uh, I, I can see that something has happened. Um, so anytime I send any command to the serial console right now, it's going to send this same command. So. Um, let's make sure that everything is wired up first this time, and then I will do that example. I'm going to take a second and get rid of the LCD screen because it's not a part of this example, and we'll just save the transmitter. Uh, what do I want to do here? Oh, yes, I want to not disconnect the whole LCD from this Arduino now that it's finally working. I'm just going to unplug the transmitter breadboard and move it over back to the original Arduino we were playing with tonight. Whew, that would have been a real shame because I have I have more intentions for uh, <laughs> for that LCD screen. I think we can use it for more, more stuff in more weeks and I will continue to, I'll glue it to the tabletop so it can never move again. Um, all right, we'll plug in our five volts, we'll plug in our ground and I'm gonna get rid of, oh, that's not ground. I'm gonna plug in ground, I'm gonna get rid of this extra dangly wire from our receiver, since we're not using it at the moment. I'm gonna plug in my signal wire here that's going to my FET. We'll look at this in just a second here. I'm gonna plug that into digital pin three. There we go. Let's see, Chris says, an IR floodlight like for night camera will cause problems with transmitting IR codes from a single transmitter, right? Yes, it's true. Um, you can transmit IR codes, the giant array of LEDs, no problem. Yes, you certainly can, Kath. In fact, I was really hoping to have um, something I've built previously for you tonight, um, which is I have built um, a couple of times now um, a rig to control IR controlled cameras for the stage um, into a, an IR control rig based on an Arduino. Um, but my current rig is sitting at the Goodman Theater in Chicago um, because it was being used in a show when everything closed down. Um, but it's an array of 10 uh, infrared LEDs that are running at 700 milliamps a piece, uh, peaking at an amp a piece. Um, no, I've got this 10 watts. So 500 milliamps, 10 LEDs at two volts, 10 watts of LED light. Um, and that got us about 40-ish feet of range in about a 20 degree cone um, under stage light as well. Um, we were probably helped with the fact that their stage, all of their IR emitters for hearing assist and things like that in their theater are pointed away from the stage. This is in the, um, the Owen Theater at the Goodman, um, which is about a 300 seat theater for those who know, um, who know the Owen. Um, but uh, yeah, 10 watts of IR light did pretty well against typical stage light, which was pretty cool. Mm. But yes, you can if you can jam your IR system by sending out too much IR light, I guess could also have been the point. Um, so just a quick look at our little IR jamming system we have here. 
can zoom this in anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very simple circuit. I have my incoming pin here from my digital pin on my Arduino. Um, that's going to uh, a little 1K resistor to the gate of my FET. This in my case is another IRLB8721B. Uh, that, that, by the way, that uh, part number is in the FET demos um, uh, slides if you go back to that episode. Um, it's just a logic level FET. Turns on and off really easily from 5 volts. I have my two 2.7 ohm resistors here and my two infrared LEDs in series that are pointing behind me toward that TV where, where we've lost, we, Sean hasn't been with us this whole time. Maybe we bring Sean back. I think I should probably need to go to the menu because uh, the command I have here is going to be the left button on the remote to step through the menu and it's not going to do anything to Sean, but we'll just, we'll just leave him. We'll just leave him there for now. Um, so the other thing I have in my circuit, I should say here, um, and this is one of those things that was kind of interesting in the development of it, is a capacitor. You may have had some capacitors come with your getting started with Arduino kit, or you may have some lying around. And the, we haven't really talked about capacitors as a part yet, um, but you can think of them as um, little, little containers that hold charge for you and take it in and give it back to your circuit very freely. Um, why that's useful is, if for something like in my case, these LEDs are going to draw a lot of power for a very short amount of time. And in fact, more power for an instant than the Arduino's uh, voltage regulator was capable of providing. So what would happen is I'd run my code, I would hear a boo as my Arduino disconnected from my computer for a second. And then a moment later, the LEDs you know, would, would turn back off and the Arduino would come right back to life. But I was sort of browning out my Arduino's power circuit whenever I ran my code. Um, by putting a capacitor here, I'm basically putting an extra bucket of charge right next to the place on my circuit where I need it. Um, and so as these LEDs draw power uh, and as that sort of voltage starts to fall because the Arduino can't sustain the voltage at that point, the capacitor is able to give some of that charge, sort of maintain that voltage at that point long enough for the Arduino to hopefully not brown out um, and not lose enough power. This is a really common use of capacitors, both in sort of freeform circuits like we do here, um, in computers and all kinds of circuits, you see capacitors next to um, things that are going to be drawing power. Um, because one of a capacitor's functions is to store bits of charge and give them back to your circuit when you need them. I was actually just glancing around to see if any of the circuits on my desk here would have a decent example. I actually see on the Arduino itself here, um, this is a, an Arduino Uno that was just sitting here, um, we have some capacitors. So those are two little capacitors there. Those are actually associated to that crystal oscillator there. There is it looks like uh, there's a couple of capacitors here next to this FET. Um, there's a big one over here next to the voltage regulator. Oh, there, these these are capacitors. These huge things are capacitors right here. So these are here to, you know, when, when the power load gets high um, and the voltage regulator can instantaneously boost its power output, these can give a little bit of charge back to the circuit right where it's needed. So what I found is I, my, I was browning myself out, so I slapped a capacitor in here. In fact, a pretty chonky one. Um, Without getting into units, this is a, a chonky one. Let's just say a chonky one. Um, it's electrolytic, which means it is polarized. So if you plug it in backward, it blows up. So if you get electrolytic capacitors, be careful. They have a minus sign on the negative side. So there you go. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to get too deep into things, especially we're only 25 minutes into tonight. So we're making really good time. Um, yeah. What did you expect to happen? <laughs> if you've been here in the, any time in the past seven weeks, you knew we weren't going to do a tight 90. It's just impossible. Sean knew. Look at Sean. Sean knows. He was like, there's, there's no way you're going to make tight 90. <laughs> I love this movie. Hunt for Red October. Not great movie. An amazing movie. Um, Transmitting. Transmitting. We were looking at transmitting. So I'm going to plug my Arduino in. I'm going to upload my code. I'm going to open my serial monitor. Let's come, oops, problem uploading the board. Oh, okay, so at the right port. Let's come back over here. Upload our code. All right, so now that we're uploaded, I said that any time you were called, before I got off into like seven different tangents, anytime I send anything, anytime you press a key, serial monitor, we will send the same command. So I actually have to get Sean back to the menu system here. Because I'm pretty sure the command that I have uh, I have stored in here is the left button command um, for my... Oh, let's see here. So if I press my left button, I actually can scroll through. That's not the easiest thing to see, right? Um, 
why don't we, why don't we go back to the disk menu? And actually, I have a way that we can make this even easier to see. Oh, let me go back. There we go. I go back to the, the disk menu. In fact, what if we got a close up on that TV? Ooh, ah, fancy, exciting. <laughs> the only problem here is, of course, you might be able to tell these are actually, I, I, I don't have an additional camera. I just have a cutout of this camera. So at some point that's going to happen, not on purpose, and it's going to be great. Um, or it's going to be really creepy. We'll have a good time. So now we have my left command programmed in here. Uh, and I every time I send a button, we should be able to go left. It's also possible that I've screwed something up. Um, let's send a letter. We'll send a command. Signal sent. Signal sent. You can see I've also put another LED in parallel with this one um, so that I, we can tell when those signals are being sent. But of course nothing's happening. Why would it? Why would it happen? Why would things work the first time? That would be very silly. All right, well, it's a, like a four line program, so it's gonna be easy to troubleshoot. I will get into this one because this is an important example. Um, I also have further examples later that I actually did test and that's fine, it's fine. Um, let me steal some code from them. Do, 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 DVD array. Let's see, it's possible I've just, I understood something later. Ah, oh, I definitely have, yes. I changed syntaxes. This is not the correct syntax. So I mentioned earlier that um, that sender was kind of a, a generic device. Um, I'm actually going to create a sender object. I'll bring it back over here for a second. We'll come back to cool creepy cam in a second here. Um, instead of doing a generic IR sender, um, I'm gonna use this IR send Samsung 36 device instead. It's going to specifically be designed to send Samsung codes. And that's important because as I learned today, Samsung devices and remotes do incorporate that address field that a lot of remotes don't. So I'm going to, instead of do an IR send, I'm going to use IR send Samsung 36 as my sender. And then my transmit command down here needs to incorporate an address. So I'm going to say, let's see here. I'm just gonna say transmit. I'm gonna steal this transmit code. And in fact, I'm gonna look up, I'm just, I'm stealing from myself in the future. I could have just easily steal from myself in the past. Um, let's make sure that this code is correct because I'd like this to work. Nope, the code is wrong too. I don't know what I was thinking. Let's re-upload this code and we'll see how we do. Let's come back to creepy cam. Oh, well, we have an error. Let's see. Oh, can I put a semicolon in? Let's uh, make sure this is uploading. No, not uploading. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's comment out the line that we don't need anymore. Always very good. Great, we're uploading. We'll come back to creepy cam. Yeah, Michael, this, I don't, I don't know what what mood I'm in tonight. Maybe, maybe week eight is just the silly week, um, or maybe it's been having like Sean in the background literally all day. Um, but uh, yeah, things are getting a little goofy tonight for sure. So. Here we go. Um, so let's see if that works. We'll open up our serial monitor here. And every time I press a key, we should send that command. Oh, well, send a command. <laughs> Wasn't the left button, apparently it was the play button. But now we're in Polyarni Inlet, <laughs> just uh, north of the Soviet naval base in Murmansk. <laughs> well, that worked out pretty well. And Sean's back. <laughs> That's great. So, Things work. So let's let's just take a quick look at that code while, while Sean, will, Sean will play. I'll hide Sean with my head here. Um, we'll take a quick review of that code now that it actually works. So um, this is the bit of code down here that came with the example, and this is what I switched to. So the normal bit of code takes a format, takes a, a chunk of data, right? So it takes your hex string, which could be, in my case, it's five hex digits long. For NEC, it can be quite a bit longer. The NEC sender takes the number of bits that you're sending with it because Samsung, as it turns out, um, takes a fixed number of bits, but does take an address. You have to sort of rewrite your code in this way. So it takes your, your data and your address and not a number of bits. And this is kind of why I want to look at GitHub later to figure out like, uh, okay, Jeff, this is all well and good, but how would you ever know that for a specific, like, what if I have a Panasonic TV? What does that look like? How do I find that out? So we'll look at some some sort of basic sleuthing you can do in both in this library and in other libraries, ways to, like, look at a, a chunk of someone else's code and start to pick out these details um, that you might need. So let's figure, let's figure out what this control is that I've sent it. I thought it was the left button, but clearly, 
Oh no, clearly it was not. It was the play command. Well, that's actually cool. So is, is Sean still playing? I think Sean's still going. Yeah, where Paramount Pictures is playing. So let's, um, I have this, some of these values that I, I recorded earlier that spoilers are associated to some other commands. Um, why don't I, why don't I pull a couple more? Ooh, I haven't stolen that many yet. Let us, uh, let's, let's find a few other commands and try them. So this is going to work exactly like we, um, we looked at with our NEC remote earlier. I'm going to just load up my dump command. Let's see here. Just a plain old dump. Examples, irlib2, dump. All right. Um, and since I, I still have, or I, I did have my receiver hooked up to the same circuit board, um, this is partly why I put these on the same circuit, by the way, is that it's often really handy to have an IR receiver hooked directly up to your project when you're having issues with IR transmission um, because of things like this. Like, oh, did I get that code wrong? Well, why don't I just switch back to my receiver and squirt my remote back into it and see if that command was right or not. Um, so I'm just gonna re-upload the dump code directly back into um into there we go into this arduino and we'll have a we'll have a look at what it's doing come back over here get this table um let's see what was our what we say our left command is what we needed let's see what our left button is yeah and so similarly like before we've got our dump command our dump code giving us this is a samsung 36 remote and here's our value for left edh27 interesting that is what i had with address 400 I thought that's what I had. Oh no, of course not. ED, OX, ED827 should be left. Great, so we'll re-upload that code. And there's no harm, by the way, in switching back and forth between pieces of code like this. This is basically what I've spent my day doing. Oh, did I get that code right? Nah, upload the dump code, check all the codes. Okay, now upload the transmitting code and try it again. You could also certainly combine these two pieces of code into the same one if you were gonna have to say, do this in the field, right? Maybe you wanted a, a piece of software that could record IR commands and then play them back for you without having to have a computer interfacing. You could absolutely have a transmitter and a receiver on the same Arduino. That would be totally workable. Oh, here's Alex Baldwin. That's very exciting. So now I'm going to have to go back to my menu. We'll have to lose Alec. Sorry, Alec Baldwin. Let's get out, get out of here, Alec Baldwin. Um, now, when I send a command to the serial command, I should be able to page left through my menu. Hey, it works. That's great. That's super exciting. So now my Arduino is controlling this DVD player directly. And so, you know, one thing to point out, um, sort of about the limitations of this, right? And I want to I want to drive it home because I've run into issues with this in the past. IR light is light and it behaves like light. So I, all my light is coming from these LEDs here and is going directly to the front of the DVD player there. So if I block line of sight between these two things, probably I'm not going to get anything. So here, let's see, I've got my scrolling left. I block my IR light and nothing gets through. I open it up again and things work fine. So. I, this this may seem trivial, but as you're planning out how to communicate between devices using remotes, just remember that they are light and they do behave like light. Um, you do get a little bit of leeway because, of course, light bounces, which is, works out very well for us. Um, so you can sometimes get bounce or refraction or reflection off of objects. Um, but most of the time, you're thinking about using an infrared remote, you need a direct line of sight between your transmitter and your receiver, right? So... Um, let's do one more example because so far we're only really transmitting one code at a time. Um, I want to look at an example where we have, we're basically going to recreate this Samsung remote in the Arduino. Um, so let's look at a, just a code structure that may be useful to you there. I um, mean, to do it, I'm actually going to need to slurp down a couple more um, of our remote codes because I, I didn't record them all earlier. So we'll get real familiar with that process. So I'm going to re-upload the dump code into the Arduino. I kind of like this view. This is kind of nice. I'm not sure that I feel great about having Sean there every week, but it's kind of fun. We'll get we'll let Sean roll there while we while we do our things. So I'm going to upload my dump code. Open my serial console. Um, I'm gonna let's see. I'm gonna play, stop, pause, skip forward, skip back. So let's see here. So let's take play. So play is going to be E27D8. Yeah, we we found that out earlier by accident. We we have, oh I see I see the problem with this view. More over here now. Um, so I'm gonna make use of some code. Let me just drop that play command in here too, which we do know. Yeah. Oh, and we we learned that our our left button command was wrong. So I'm going to copy and paste that in here real quick before I lose it. Oops. Why, why was that? Oh, that's weird. 
That is weird. They're sending the same code. I don't like that at all. E270. Um, all right, we'll figure that out in a second here. So this is the code for our uh, our fake uh, Arduino LED remote. Um, our includes look very similar to before. We have this sender base. We have only the protocol that we need, and uh, our combo includes kind of sort of wrap everything together for us. I created this IR send Samsung device, um, which is going to only send Samsung commands. Um, and then I have this um, this number of keys that I want to um, define as the, the number of things I want to remember. And I had to make it a constant so I could use it to tell these arrays how many members they had in them before I start actually running code. So constant int, never gonna change. It's 16 keys that I'm running about. Of course, if I add more keys, I can just change this number, totally fine. Um, so I'm gonna create two arrays here. And this, there's lots of different ways you could structure this code, but here's how I'm gonna do it. Um, I'm gonna create two arrays, one of which has a number of strings that I'm going to want to send to the device from the serial console. And I'm going to have another array um, that's going to contain the codes to transmit that match up one-to-one -one with their positions in the first array. So in other words, when I see the word play from the serial console, I want to send uh, E28D7. When I see the word stop, I want to send a stop command, which we'll put in here in a second. Um, if I want to have the uh, skip forward or skip back, those will match up to these positions here. So really what I'm going to do when I see a word from the serial console, I'm going to say, oh, what position is that word in? Oh, it's in position uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. So send the code in position 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? That's how this structure is going to work. And the rest of the code just accomplishes that. Um, it just says, you know, if uh, if there's something on the serial console, take a string out of it using this serial.read string command. Um, and then step through all the members of my array. Um, if the input is equal to the a member of the first array, that array of strings, that keys array, if we're equal to there, then transmit the corresponding value in the second array. And in my case, transmit it to address 400, because apparently this is an address 400 remote, and that seems to work well. And then I'm going to have it send back some additional data over the serial console to me, using these serial.print commands to say, hey, I sent the command in this position. Um, if I see a command, uh, if, I, if I have received something on the serial console and I don't have a match, then say, hey, I, I don't know what to do here. I'm not sending anything. Cool. So I have the play command set in there. Let's take another couple quick commands just so we can see what this is doing. Um, I will take this. Uh, I will take this. There we go. Um, let's get uh, pause in there. Pause is E4CB3. Let's come up here. Do I have pause? I don't. So that'd be interesting. So I'm going to add a member to my first array. Pause. Uh, I'm going to increment this number by one, say 17. And I'm going to add this value, OXE4CB3, to the end of my second array. So now this pause value and this number here line up in their positions in the array. So I know when I see the word pause on my serial console, my program will send this command. Yeah. So let's get a couple more values out here. Come back over here. Um, let's do fast forward. Be nice. Uh, EA875D. We will drop that in here. Fast forward is one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That must be here. And again, we'll put that zero X in front of it to remind the program that it's a hex value. Um, and let's do rewind. Let's get back to, oops, rewind here. Rewind looks like it is E48B7. So come back into our code. Rewind is the one before that. So OX, AP7. So now I have play, pause, fast forward, and rewind. So I will upload that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, it, it has been a joy to have like a demo that has um, actual, uh, you know, like a, a more interesting visual based around it. Um, kind of fun. Oh, we're, we're, we're in the deeps now. Oh, this is a good fun. I... I won't go down a tangent. I love this film. I really do. It's if Tim Curry is great. He doesn't try and do a Russian accent at all. He's just British Tim Curry. Um, he's really good. Um, Sean Connery is really good. Alec Baldwin is really good. Great film. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, so now this is uploaded. If I open my serial console here, I'll just clear that out. Um, it's listening for essentially any of these values that we taught it. Play, stop, forward, backward. And of course, some of them we haven't assigned actual commands to yet. Like it's gonna send nothing. Um, but if I send the pause command, hopefully here, give you the view of Alec. Um, now we're in the sub. If I send pause, hopefully that works. Let's see if it doesn't. 
we'll try something else. Yeah, there we go. So now we're in fast forward. If I send it again, I mean, I've got incremented fast forward on this device. There we go. So now we're really zooming forward. We're moving through Jonesy, we're moving through the radar room. It was Paganini, um, way out there at Pearl. We're really zooming through here. Now, if I hit the play command again, we will see, we should come back in a moment here. It's not the fastest to respond device, to normal speed. We missed that whole that whole great scene with Jonesy. We just fast forwarded right through it. And again, so that was, I was typing in, for those who couldn't see, I was typing in FF or FF or play in here. And it was looking through this array to say, hey, where is FF? Where is play? Ah, FF is in position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ah, so I'm gonna output 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm gonna output this code. Um, now, of course, it doesn't know exactly what that code does. It's just saying, hey, it matches up to this position in this array, send that code out. And then I've told it to spit back on the serial console what it just did, mostly for my own use. So, about the TV view, what else did we teach it? Uh, let's see, we taught it to do, look back what commands we actually taught it. Pause, enter. Oh, we can rewind. Maybe we want to go back and see, I think, what did I say? Rewind is just rewind. Rewind. Send that out. Just make sure that took. Oh yeah, we, we missed all the drama with the political officer who snuck onto the sub and is some, uh, it turns out to, spoilers, not be the only KGB agent on board the sub. He's really great. So we'll make sure we want to go back and watch that scene. So every time I write the rewind command in, it's going to send the rewind command from my Arduino and that's going to send that out to the TV, increment our rewind state. Ken says, if there's 17 codes, why is pause in slot 15? Here, let me let me get this movie rolling forward again so we don't run past the intro credits. What did you say, Kenneth? Uh, let's see. Why is pause in slot 15? 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 0 to 16. So we have 17, 17 positions there, I think. Right? Am I counting wrong? I might be counting wrong. Counting is not my thing. I, I got a math minor, so I'm not a great counter. Um, they only give the majors to good counters. Hmm. We've gone down, <laughs> we've, it's, I don't know. It's a funny week, y'all. You, you gotta laugh in times like these where you can, and I guess tonight that's <laughs> that's me. Um, but that's that's the gist of sending codes from uh, an Arduino to, uh, to any given device. Um, the demo that I was hoping to do for tonight with these LED candles works in a very similar way. And I might still be able to do it because I think I have the codes recorded, recorded somewhere. Um, but let's at least, I want to at least show you the code for that, um, because I think it's for those who are thinking about doing IR control with, um, uh, of devices, especially in a theater, since I know there's lots of theater people in the crowd tonight, um, and thinking about controlling that over DMX, here is one way that you might do it. So let's come back over here. We'll let, uh, we'll let Captain Mancuso do his thing. Um, so these examples, of course, are on the website as well. Um, they are the I, I so, so uh, a little preface, I split this code over actually two separate Arduinos. Um, and there is a good reason and a bad reason for it. Um, let me, um, one is uh, in the original prototype, I had a lot of hardware and very little time to build anything with. Um, and, ah, we didn't talk about conflicts. Kenneth, we didn't talk about wiring conflicts. Let's talk about them now. So. On the Arduino, there are basically three bits of internal hardware called hardware timers that do all the timing-related things for you. What I mean by timing-related things? Well, that millis or micros function that, that tells us the number of milliseconds since we've started, that relies on a hardware timer that counts the number of milliseconds. Pulse width modulation relies on a timer to know when to turn that pin on or off about 500 times a second. A timer is literally just an internal counter that that the, the code you've written has behind the scenes configured to reset at a certain point. Um, so for a pulse modulation timer, um, I might say, hey, count up to 256 and I will turn on uh, this output at the number that you specify. So if you do analog write 200, I'm gonna count to 256 over and over again. Every time I get to 200, I'll turn on. Every time I get to 256, I'll turn off. That takes up one hardware timer. There are only three hardware timers called timer zero, timer one, and timer two on your device. And some of these libraries, some of these functions, some of these libraries make use of these timers for other things than their default values. Um, so <laughs> I can't look at the chat right now. We're deep into it. So um, 
So pulse width modulation makes use of those timers. So um, there are six pulse width modulation outputs we know uh, on pins 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11. Those each make use of, of uh, two of them share, uh, two pins share a single timer. So if you take away timer one, say, to do something else, like control the output of a fast flickering LED in an IR library, you lose some functionality elsewhere in your board. Um, so uh, it turned out when I was writing this original code to control an IR sender via DMX, the DMX library and the IR library used the same timer. And my options were to rewrite one of those two libraries. Now, now the IR library has actually evolved. There's some ability to configure which of those timers you use, and they're not all equivalent. Um, but at the time, not configurable. They both use the same, the same timer. So my options were to rewrite the library or, or add to the library to make it possible to use a different timer, or use one Arduino to receive the DMX, use some kind of signal to a second Arduino, and then do the sending. And there are, like, there are lots of other ways to solve this problem. I could have used a bigger or faster Arduino or another microcontroller, but like I say, I had a lot of Arduinos on hand and very little time. So I basically slaved the two of them together, used one to control, uh, to receive the DMX, send a signal to the other one for when to send the IR signal. Um, and so this is gonna be actually two different Arduino sketches, one to receive DMX and output a signal, and one to receive that signal and transmit IR. So let's take a quick, quick look at that. Um, we don't need to get super down the rabbit hole into DMS control libraries, although I sort of suspect that might be kind of a hot topic given who our crowd has been um, with a lot of theater folks in the audience. So maybe we should do um, a thing on like DMX sending and receiving hardware. Uh, maybe not a whole night, but I think that would be kind of a interesting topic. Yes? No? Let me know. Um, so we'll breeze over some of the, um, the specifics of the DMX library tonight, because that's not the point of the thing. I'm configuring it up here. I'm telling it I want to have two different channels of control. DMX, as I think I've mentioned here before, has 512 possible addresses. Um, so I'm telling this listen to address 510, because I have two addresses. I'm listening to addresses 510 and 511. Um, it's going to be a DMX slave device, which means it's listening to the signal line, as opposed to a DMX master device, which controls a signal line. Um, and, um, all it's going to do, if we skip down to the meat of our program here, we see this very familiar control structure, which I, I called, if the time is later than the last time we checked on the baby, plus how long we're supposed to wait between baby checkings, um, the last time we updated our slave, plus the minimum of time we wait between the two, then, um, start with our, our default output value, and then if our channel value is less than zero, output is zero. If it's greater or less than 127, which is half of its maximum value, output is zero. Otherwise, output a two. And there's some configuration options in here as well. And that's the gist of it. I'm just looking at this incoming channel value and saying, hey, is it less than half? Turn off. If it's more than half, turn on. So that's the DMX receive code. And that's literally turning on and off a digital pin on one Arduino that's connected to a second Arduino's digital input pin. So let's take a quick look at that code because it should look fairly familiar by now. I'm including, this is actually was written in IRLib1. Um, I should really rewrite it for IRLib2, because like I say, they're not compatible. Um, and I have my two NEC messages here that I slurped in from the little dinky IR remote that came with those candles. Um, it was uh, candles turning on, the on button turned out to be FF807F, and the off button turned out to be FF00FF. I also am gonna have this send, uh, send the message multiple times every time I'm supposed to send a message. Um, so that's gonna make things a little bit more reliable for us. But a lot of this looked really familiar. I'm gonna create this IR sender message. I'm gonna remember that the last state I was in, um, so when the state changes, I know I wanna send the message because of course, what I want to do is when the DMX value is goes from low to high, turn the candles on. When the DMX value goes from high to low, turn the candles off. Um, that's how I chose to implement this device. So, um, Here's what I am doing. Oh, I also had a button hooked up to it so I could say, hey, if the button is pressed, just send the on command. Like that was a nice default feature, a nice debug feature. I, things are blowing up over here. What is happening? Oh, Kenneth. Ah, sorry, sorry, Kenneth. No, it's, it's too late. It's too late. Yes, lots of lots of theater people <laughs> in the crowd tonight. Yeah, the Conceptonetics library. If you're if you're looking to start getting into DMX and Arduino, Conceptonetics is the way to go. Hmm. TV on and off with IR commands, totally possible. Yes, this is exactly the kind of code you would use. And if you wanted to, um, if you were looking for like a consultant or anything to come and um, build you a device or lend you an IR controller from his stock, 
um, once his stock comes back from the theater it's currently mothballed in. I know a guy. Let me know. Um, Anyway, to come really quickly back to the transmitting code, right? So this is receiving an on or an off signal from this other Arduino. Um, it's saying, you know, basically using some logic to say, hey, if the last state was off and the current state is on, um, do do an, do this event, do this sending. Um, and it's going to be based on the states of actually the two digital signal pins that I had kind of in between them. I decided I wanted not only to have the ability to... Um, to send when we go from low to high or high to high to low. But I also wanted the operator to say, hey, mm, not all the candles turn on. I want to force them to turn on um, or force them to turn off without changing the primary DMX level. So I had this secondary control line listening to the second DMX channel that sort of changed the behavior of the device. So you can dig into all this here or I can, if you're interested in finding a consultant to build this for you. I'll send you the spec sheet. Um, this basically sets the mode of the device based on the, the state of pins one and two. And then um, based on those states, sends sends our candles on message or sends our candles off message. Just that simple. So a lot of this is like, you know, I want to you know, send this multiple times. I have this times to send loop here and that's configurable because we found that sending once was a little unreliable, but sending more than that's kind of unnecessary. So we sent each message five times when we got the message to send things on or off. Um, put a little delay in there so it wasn't sending too, too quickly, that kind of thing. Um, but that was the gist of controlling an IR controlled device over DMX. Um, I want to... Um, I wish I, I wish I had this. It's still, it's at another theater that's currently closed in Chicago Shakespeare. Um, one other IR control project we had, and I, I should have pulled pictures for, um, we had a, um, a wall for a production of Romeo and Juliet with a number of sconces on it into which actors placed IR controlled Luminara candles, which for those who haven't seen them, it's those kind of LED candles. So, so this one, I'll come back to the real view. This one has a little dinky IR, a little LED inside that like flickers and looks pretty awful. The Luminara ones are the style that have a little waving piece of plastic with an IR, with a, an LED that bounces off them and they look really good. So in this production, um, we had a wall of sconces into which actors placed these very nice looking LED candles and the director wanted them to be able to turn on and off after the actors had handled them and put them in the wall and to be able to turn on and off in zones, in individually ideally, but really in chunks. Um, and uh, that's kind of a tall order. So what we decided was we build IR transmitters into the this wall itself, into the back of each sconce, pointed at the IR receiver inside each of these candles. Um, and then we had some, some logic to say, um, based on the incoming DMX, turn on um, certain channels and turn certain channels off. Um, so let's say there were four zones. If... Um, if uh, channel one goes from low to high, send the on command to channel one. If channel two goes from high to low, send the off command to channel two, and so on. The trick there, and I realize we didn't get all the way down the rabbit hole of hardware conflicts with the IR library. So um, I think I referenced this earlier in, into the fact that um, this, this uh, receiver I sent into digital pin two by choice, but my transmitter is on pin three of the Arduino Uno and has to be on pin three. Um, and that's because of the timer that it is making use of to generate the pretty high frequency signals that this LED is sending out. Um, so um, you, this sort of limits our, our ability to do other things with various pins. And it's actually partly why we ran into this issue earlier, why I had to move one of my connections from my RGB LED from pin three to pin nine, because pin three was taken up by my transmission code when I looped this into the code later. Um, so it, it, it's, I'm partly pointing this out because it's not super well documented. I mean, it, it's in the code for the IRLib2 library, but it's not called out anywhere in big capital letters in the way that I think it should be because it's a real tripping point for someone who's working with that library for the first time. If you're transmitting with this library, your transmitter is on pin three. Um, it also means you can't have multiple transmitters on multiple pins of your library. And so to do this zoned control, um, where we had a, a, you know, a certain candles turning on, certain candles turning off, what we ended up having to do, uh, what, we, what we chose to do at least, was implement some logic in hardware to control where the signal was going. So we basically had a single transmitter, a single low power transmitter. Um, you know, basically the digital pin was connected to some logic gates um, and some other digital pins controlled whether that signal basically passed through to a given amplifier 
or not based on the DMX that was coming in or going out. I wonder if I, I might, this is, I'm, it, going to be kind of a punt. If it doesn't happen in 20 seconds, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll punt on it, but I want to see if I have this code. Um, cause I, I didn't think about this example until, until just now, but it's really was kind of interesting. I may not have it on this computer is the real honest truth. Um, Ooh, short shake, short shakes, wall master. There it is. That's what it is. I do have that code. That's kind of cool. And it turned out, ha, Kenneth, I found it before I saw your snarky comment on the chat. I think we need a unit of time for when I can solve a problem in the latency of YouTube. I think that should that should count as like a rounding error of doing it correctly. Mm. All right, let's let's take a look at this quick code. Oh, real quick, what's what's happening here? <laughs> yes, Chris. Yes, Chris. Next time you need IR control, call me. I will I will gladly come. Um, yeah, and Kenneth is right. You don't you don't get any response as to whether your thing is turned on or not. Um, so having a thing that has an on code and an off code, great. Having a thing that has a like power button that just is maybe on or maybe off, not ideal. Um, Palmer says, can our Arduino read DMX natively, or do you need a shield? Ah, so Chris says you need a shield. You should have a shield. It will make things much better. You don't technically need one. Um, but it is good to have one. Um, I, but you, you need one. You need one. You don't, you don't really need one, but you need one. Um, we should talk about DMX some night. That would actually be a really fun time. Um, the LED candles that I used did have separate codes for on and off. In fact, so um, the installation that these are in before, we'll look at the code for the wall in a second because I think it is really neat. But the installation that these were in at the Goodman, or I guess still at this moment are in at the Goodman, um, there was some interest in, so the, the staging there is um, a dozen or so candles get pulled out of a bag, turned on. Uh, you know, they, they pull out of a bag, it turns their back, oh, candle's on, turned on, and then they all turn off in the blackout later. And there was some interest in um, could the candles turn off in individual smaller groups later on? And because they were all just sitting on the same table, that wasn't super possible. And the idea that I floated um, uh, to the master electrician and not to the um, not to the production management staff because it was complicated and, and a bit of a pain. Um, different brands of candles, sometimes, you know, different individual tiny candles, but, you know, if I got a candle like this and a bigger candle, a luminar candle would often have different on and off codes. So if we wanted to be really fancy, we could have done a thing where we had different types or sizes of candle that happened to have different on or off codes um, and then sent them individually to turn on or off groupings of candles on the table. Because of course, if you have a bunch of identical candles on the table, they will all turn on or all turn off. All the candles of this brand, all the candles that came out of the same box of 40 that this one were in had the same and will have the same on or off code, but different brands often differ. Um, so we decided, <laughs> I was shot down. We're told that was not necessary because uh, let's face it, that is overkill. Um, but just a thing to consider as you're looking at controlling multiple devices. Um, if you're thinking about like a wall of TVs on stage that wants to be turned on and off remotely, um, them having um, different codes may be a blessing or a curse depending on what you what you want to do with them. How do we get down that rabbit hole? I don't know. We were going to talk about code. So this is just a little bit of the, um, a little bit of the code for this, this short shakes wall multi-controller, um, has a very similar control structure, right? We're only going to check for an update every, I think 50 milliseconds or so. Um, and then it's going to generate this value based on combining how many slave addresses? I think four. Four. So it's a four channel controller um, and it was generating this number, um, which is um, composed of a series. This is not great code. I would not do it this way now, but basically it was generating a number between one and 15. Um, if the first channel should be on, it should be plus or minus one. Second channel should be on plus or minus two. Third should be on plus or minus four and so on. Then it was sending that value out over SPI, which is a thing we haven't talked about yet. It's uh, I squared C. I squared C, a way of sending um, data between microcontrollers and integrated circuits. I squared C, IIC, inter integrated circuit protocol. Kenneth, correct me there. IIC, often called I squared C. Um, sending that value out over I squared C to the other Arduino, which was making choices based on the value that it was receiving. Um, like I said, I wouldn't necessarily do it this way now, um, but I think it is kind of interesting. 
Um, and then the slave device, because this was similar that we had a master device reading the DMX and a slave device um, sending sending the actual signal. So again, I have my, my candle signals here. You can see these are very similar bits of code because they're written not long after each other. Um, was basically saying, um, here we go. If, um, was basically decoding those powers of two that it was getting in. And if there was a power of two present, let's say this was a number, it was one plus four plus eight. So outputs one and four and eight should be on. Turn on certain digital pins to turn on hardware and gates um, that would allow that signal to pass through. And then once the proper state was on, send the on message to just those candles. And then the candles that should be off Let's say in this example, we have uh, we our number was one plus four plus eight, which is 13. So there's no number two in there in our binary system. So we would send the off command to only those candles uh, by turning off some hardware AND gates and then sending the off command to only that set of transmitters. That was, that probably didn't make a ton of sense. This would be a, much, a better demo when I have the thing back in my person. And when I do, I'll come show it off. It's really quite cool. Um, but um, this is one way to sort of get around the limitation that the the Arduino Uno, at least, can only send um, IR on pin 3 because it is tied to a specific hardware timer inside the Arduino. Um, so, and like I say, it's not really called out anywhere in the examples. Like, you know, I was like, oh, you can hook up to pin 6 or pin 10 or I'm already using pin 3. No, it's got to be on pin 3 of the Uno. So watch yourself there. Um, why don't we try, why don't we drop those candle codes into... um into our controller here and see if we can control this candle. That'll be a nice closer for our night. So I will steal these two candle codes, which I believe are NEC codes. Yeah, NEC one version codes. But I think I mentioned earlier, a lot of these generic cheapy remotes that you're gonna get with these, these inexpensive controllers are this NEC format. Um, so if you when you see that, don't be, don't be terribly surprised. Um, I'm just gonna build this into my, my sending example from earlier. You are here, so comment out my Samsung code, bring back my NEC code. Um, and I'm going to need to take this back to being a generic IR sender. I have my NEC library included at the top still. That was generous of me. Um, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this out of the serial loop here. So just delete some comments. Um, I'm going to do uh, send the on code, uh, delay, 1000 my sender dot send NEC and we'll send our off code. Uh, zero, do I need a zero there? I don't know that I do. It's a nice thing about having other code from the, uh, yes, candles on 20. There we go. And we'll delay another second. And we'll take out that serial command there. So we'll just send the candles on command, then we'll wait uh, a second, then we'll send the candles off command, then we'll wait a second. So hopefully, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm literally just copying and pasting this. So there's a good chance that the syntax here is not exactly correct. So we'll have to do just a tiny bit of troubleshooting, a tiny bit of real troubleshooting, not Jeff Glass troubleshooting, which seems to be sort of a rabbit hole. Um, but let's see here. Oh, helps if I turn the candle on. Hey! There we go. It worked first time. Hey, look at that. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is the gist of IR candle control. Is you're just you're choosing when to send those on and off commands. In my case, I'm doing it once a second, turn it on, once a second, turn it off. Um, but as we've seen, you could tie that to DMX control. You could also tie that to a physical push button. Um, you could tie that to both. You could say, I want this to be on DMX control, um, but I want to give my... Um, my ASM backstage, um, a button that controls a high power LED transmitter that just sends uh, the uh, off command for some reason. Um, or uh, or maybe maybe in the final show blackout, it's not always consistent. So I want them to be able to hammer on the off button to be able to turn this candle off um, whenever they want it to. Um, Guess says tie it to a light sensor. You certainly could. Yeah, you could. You could send it so um when the lights in your room go out, um you have this sitting in a corner that sends a command to turn on all the little LED candles in your room. That would actually be kind of cool. Um, 
there is also, um, I have seen in some theater theater practice books, um, you could do this the other way. You could have a little tiny transmitter on, uh, say, on stage somewhere um, with a, maybe a bunch of LEDs going in a circle. And so when the blackout comes at a certain point, this blasts out a bunch of turn off commands and it just turns the candles off whenever we're in a blackout situation. That's a sort of a very, a very common use case for these candles in my world is they turn on lit and they stay lit and they're fine. Um, but when the stage goes dark, we don't want to see 60 points of stupid glowing LED candles on stage. Um, so you might have a, a transmitter hidden somewhere hooked up to a light sensor to accomplish that. Or probably DMX is more consistent, but lots of possibilities there. Mm. Yeah, cool. I'm glad that worked first try. Yeah, I can't. That, that is maybe um, the impromptu demo that did work, I think is um, redemption for the impromptu demo at the start of our night that didn't work. So I feel pretty good about that. Alec, how do you feel about it? Oh, we're in the slideshow. This is Pagorin is... Uh, it's all complicated. There's Kremlinology happening. He's about to get grilled by the chief of staff. It's a really, it's a really good movie. <laughs> um, it's not a good movie, but it's a really good movie. Um, and now we can take full control of it with our remote. I should say, um, if you wanted to get deeper into this, things you might look into, um, you can look into further control protocols. Um, you can look into, you know, Samsung has one, Sony has one. There is also, and we didn't really touch on it too much tonight, um, but there is a way of capturing IR signals that don't correspond to any known decoder. Um, let me open up an example just to give you a quick idea of what I mean. Um, this is the raw receive example um, from the, uh, the IRLib I, uh, I, uh, library. Oof, words. Upload that real quick. I'll show you what the output looks like. Um, this is actually where I thought we were going to sort of have to go tonight because um, I wasn't getting consistent decodes off of this Samsung remote. Um, but here, I'll show you what happens. Um, so if you have a remote that cannot be decoded by the dump sketch, if it doesn't correspond to any known decoder in the IRLib2 library, you can also use this raw receive sketch and it will give you literally the raw data, the on and off for the mark and space of what it is seeing. So as I press the different buttons, it is just recording raw on and off times. Um, and then you can write some code or make use of some code in, for example, the, let me pull this up here, the IRLib um, example of raw send, which rather than taking in a nice clean hex string, you can copy and paste um, some of yours, I blow it away. Yeah, you can copy and paste some of your raw data in here and it will send your raw data back out of the remote. So even if you have a strange remote, and I, I can imagine a situation, especially those of you who are dealing with like weird TVs built into walls and CRT, you know, uh, very stylistic things, might have a remote that is either old enough or weird enough that it doesn't have a known protocol. You can use this raw capture ability to just capture the generic IR data that is coming into your system, capture it and just play that directly back. You probably have to do a, you know, a little bit of extra work to like make that manageable so you're not, you know, make this a little clean. Um, but you could base that around that raw send and raw receive code. Um, the thing you won't be able to do without different hardware is if you have a remote, and there is some chance that this remote was one before it died. Um, if you have a remote that's operating on a different IR frequency, your receiver won't natively be able to receive it. Um, so I said before, this was modulating at a frequency of 38 kilohertz. Um, there are some remotes out there, especially apparently some old RCA ones, and I, I don't know if this RCA one counts as old for these purposes, um, that modulate at 56 kilohertz. Um, so the, the, the literally the on and off of the IR LED in that is much faster than this receiver is trying to demodulate. And this receiver is meant to ignore signals that are oscillating that fast. Um, so this might be a situation, you know, one way you might decide that you're in this situation is um, you, you try your remote, you try your dump sketch, it's not working. You point your camera phone at it. You say, oh, I'm seeing the little blinking light. Um, I know it's outputting something, um, but I'm not pinging up anywhere here. Maybe I need to do some Googling, see if I can figure out if this is at a different frequency. Turned out this one was at a different frequency. It's at zero frequency. It doesn't turn on, but um, a thing you might want to be aware of if you're using this to play around with older remotes. Um, I guess we could do one um, one nighttime demo. That might be kind of fun. We'll do some. We'll do one candlelight demo, and then I I think we'll probably be done for the evening. Ooh, it'll just be me, me and Alec here in the background, hanging out. Um, I want to show you what it looks like when you look at. Uh, let's see if this. I don't know if this camera will see it. Probably not. This is too good of a camera. Ooh, yeah, there you go. So I'm holding I'm holding the remote in my hand here, and I'm pointing it up at this top facing camera here. Look what happens when I press a button. Let's see if we can see it here. 
Ooh, you're mostly seeing the glare from the from the light itself behind me. Let's see if I, I probably can't show you on my camera phone, and if not, we'll just we'll end with this very sensual late night Arduino demos. I'm gonna show you my camera phone on my on my phone here. Yeah, see that there? See how my camera phone is seeing as I'm pressing a button on the remote? See it's blinking. It's a very good sign. Of course, in real life, you can't see anything. Even if I turn the gain way up. You wouldn't be able to see. You might be able to see. I think you're just seeing reflection off that LED there. But as I point my camera phone at it, you can see the LED blink. A super easy, super cheap, um, like, go, no-go test for your remote. And honestly, for your remote's batteries. So this might be useful even if you're not messing around with homebrew, um, homebrew remote situations. Um... That's all I can think of talk about tonight. Gosh, we talked about a lot. Look at that. We're at 88 minutes on the dot. Just under 90. Piece of cake. This is actually shorter than we've been the past three or four weeks. I'm actually pretty impressed um, with myself, I guess. <laughs> um, we got uh, Alec probably helped. Oh, this is a great scene. Um, yeah, I think that's all we're going to talk about tonight. We talked about um, infrared uh, sending, infrared receiving. That was the goal tonight. I will be honest, I'm not sure what to talk about next week. So I have a little bit of business to talk to you about here, but um, in the meantime, I want to hear your suggestions for like, you know, the purpose of, ostensibly of this series was if you had a getting started with Arduino kit um, and you, you know, we're starting with it from scratch, how would you use all the pieces of it? And we've gone through a lot of the stuff that's in there and honestly, a lot of the stuff that's not necessarily in there. I'm curious what you guys want to talk about next. So pop into the chat and uh, give me some ideas. Um, or, um, Chris, I want to, I see Chris want to order some new parts. Chris, what are you thinking about? Drop us some like, and this is, this is, this is safe space. Like never, never will I judge anyone for completing or not completing their projects. As I look around the places all off camera here of uncompleted projects, you're not promising yourself to anything, but I'm curious, like what people are like, Ooh, I want to try this. I want to try that. And, or what do you think we should talk about in the next couple of weeks? So drop it in the chat. I'm, I'm really curious. Um, I'll do the business in the meantime, and then I want to come back to um, to your answers um, as I bring myself back up to the camera, so I'm not a tiny guy in the corner. Ooh, let's come, let's come here, and uh, me and Al can can serenade you out for the evening. Um, <laughs> thank you for another great Sunday night. I I really I really had a great time tonight. This was a whole heck of a lot of fun. Um, I think you can probably tell we got a little bit silly here in the middle of the evening, but. Um, but you know, it's been it's been a weird week. It's a, and it's a weird time. So it's it's really nice to come together on these Sunday nights and just just build stuff and try stuff. And honestly, it was fun to fail in front of you all for a little bit. Like having that demo right off the bat that that didn't really work very well was kind of awesome. And honestly, now having a demo that does work is uh, is kind of awesome too. So I'm, I'm glad we redeemed. Oh, glad we redeemed ourselves. All right, <laughs> that's the problem with this camera. We'll stop now. <laughs> oh my gosh, I come back on my come back on my remote and we'll. We'll come back to the real camera here. Um, so really, so thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have concerns, um, the fastest way to reach me is on Twitter at Jeffers, at Jeffers Glass. Um, you can also leave a comment on any of the posts on the website at jeff.glass. That's bash. Um, there's also, a, I guess, there's a Facebook event every week that we, we schedule these on. Um, we will meet back here next Sunday at 7 p.m. Central for another another uh fundamentals of arduino class this will be number nine which will be wild i will try and get the code online it'll probably be consistently good by about sunday morning um so feel free to follow along or if you're watching this in the future which i guess you might be go to jeff.glash slash electronics bash uh, and you'll find all of the code from tonight um, as well as the slides that we looked at for circuit diagrams and things like that um that will be kind of a neat place to have this archived um Chris wants to add a dip switch to his DMX light control instead of DMX address being hard coded, but also IR receivers for fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I I have a DMX module here. Actually, um, hang on a sec. Uh, let's see, where are you going to be? We're going to have the table. I'm not going to see Jeff Tummy Cam tonight. Um, I the, my project at the moment that I'm working on. Well, one of my 17 projects that I'm working on off camera here. Um, that needs a new revision. Is Related, actually, it's this guy, um, which is a circuit board. This is actually the circuit board that's in the Goodman IR controller right now, um, which has uh, headers for two DMX Pro Minis, um, so there and there. It has extra sort of prototyping headers along each side. It has spaces for, hard to see there, spaces for DMX control circuitry along this side here. 
voltage regulation, a little proto area over here, and then six output FETs that are tied to the six PWM lines on the secondary Arduino. And this, if it had dip switch addressing, Chris, you maybe think of this, if it had a dip switch where you could set the DMX address, would be a really great general purpose control board. Um, because it's basically, it lets, you know, if you have a single Arduino, a lot of my projects, and especially for Theater World, tend to be, you know, take an Arduino and use it to control two, three, one high power-ish, low voltage things. So you slap an Arduino on here, you write some code, you hook up a FET, you put a nice terminal on the output. I don't know, I have terminals here somewhere. I need to see Jeff Tummy Cam because I can't be bothered to change the camera twice. I've got these adorable little screw terminals snap in here like this uh, like that solder those in place you do the solder connections when you're done with the whole darn thing and you're done prototyping um just like a nice generic like controller project and the, the thing that i miss most uh, no tummy cam again the thing that i miss most is um dip switch addressing for that little tiny switches that i can control the address with so the next revision of this board i i swear will have that um and then the next revision will need something else and then we'll do something else um anyway um, so yeah, so so dip switches would be a great addition to something like that, and, and it's a good, it's a definitely good thought. I've also had this random thought, and now I'm just rambling, um, about um, a generic dip switch um, module that would have a, a nine or ten position dip switch and um, a a parallel in serial out shift register in it. So we talked about shift registers a couple weeks ago that you sent serial data into and they were used to do parallel outputs. You can also get the reverse to use inputs. You can use a shift register to read multiple inputs and then have them shift that data into your device to read from multiple inputs. And I'm, I've had this dream for a while about a device that was a little circuit board that would have uh, dip switches on it and a shift register and you could just basically set your dip switches and shift an address into your device using just a couple of digital pins. I think that would be really cool. It's the implementation details that I can't quite work out um, in terms of like detecting whether it's connected or not, but maybe that's overkill. Anyway, dip switch is super useful. Brian says, can we break down code topics more like a segment on math, breaking down coding more in topics? Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk about code more it's tricky, right? So like two weeks ago, was it when we talked about building the snake game? That was like step, like, you know, first flash at talking about code on stream. And I, to be candid, I thought that was like maybe one of the more informative times and also probably one of the most boring. Like talking about code is just kind of not a visual medium uh, or at least like streaming is not necessarily the like the best way to talk about it. Um, or is it like maybe that maybe like taking a chunk of code that we wrote in it that I wrote in advance and just like walking through improvements to it was not super like the most clear way to build on it. May like is there a way that we could figure out to like write the code together or write it write it in real time? Um, of course, the the challenge there is that I it, you know if you screw it up, we could spend like a you know it we wouldn't be uncommon to like spend five or ten minutes solving a coding problem, and if we have you know five of those debugging that's only five new things fixed in an hour so i'm trying to figure out how how to do coding on a stream like this in an interesting way i i i 100 percent agree that like that is where we need to go because we are rapidly building up our arsenal of cool inputs and outputs to do with arduinos um and we just we're, we haven't quite been keeping up in the same way with programming strategies. Um, so, so which is, is not to poo-poo the idea. We totally should. And I, I will totally think about um, how to do that. And if you guys have suggestions, I would actually love to hear them. Because um, I think that, like, it, especially, like, is there anything, now that we're all just, we're just all here and chatting, um, we, um, because there, are there any specific programming topics in the last few weeks that you've been like, oh, I, that's interesting. I'd like to go more in depth on that, or I didn't quite understand this thing, or um, I've tried to do this and that before and it hasn't quite worked. Michael says, is a Zoom meeting? Yeah, for sure. Actually, you know, um, Kenneth, who's been our moderator, our, our gracious moderator all these weeks, and I um, did a test of um, a Zoom to stream setup a few weeks ago, which was actually really successful, I thought, technologically. Kenneth can, can tell us in the chat if he disagreed, um, which is kind of cool because, you know, I'm sure there are people out there who would want to 
chime in and be a part of it and like ask questions. And there are people, which is totally fair, who just want to like observe, like who are probably on your couches right now and just like watching or have it on in the background or you're making pie or whatever you do on a Sunday night. And that's, that's totally fine. Like, I love that. Like wherever you are, whether you're at a workbench or on your couch in whatever state of pants you're wearing, totally cool. Like that's great. So I feel like maybe doing a zoom and then, you know, also like just taking the output and plopping it onto the stream. So if people wanted to just watch, they can. Um, and then it's also recorded later. Um, or if it turns out to be a little ribbled, we can delete it later. Um, so that's actually, that's kind of a cool idea. Um, is it, I wonder if it's possible to, like, I don't know. I, well, we should, we should think about this more. Because, like, is it possible to do um, some kind of, like, so there's one version of this, right, where I am writing code on some kind of hardware and people in the Zoom are observing or asking questions of various things, which is, I think that would be totally interesting. Um, we need to pick, we want to pick up an interesting visual project that would give us some feedback as we did various things. Maybe it's like the LCD screen project where there's lots of things you could do. Maybe it's like a NeoPixels project. That would be fun. We didn't talk about these the other day, but, but NeoPixels are um, individually, you, so a lot of you out there who I happen to know, know what NeoPixels are. They're individually controllable RGB LEDs. So they're kind of like if each LED had a shift register built into it, you connect them all together in serial and you pump data through them and they light up sort of individually as you control them. Something like that, that has visual feedback um, that we could use to be like, oh, how would you set up a control structure that does X? Like, you know, how would you turn them all the same color? How would you make them do a rainbow? Um, these ones actually are kind of cool. These can be, um, this actually might be kind of an interesting project um, because this particular PCB, which is, I think, a, a, it's an Adafruit project, love Adafruit, um, are, are NeoPixels that are meant to go under a membrane so they can be pixels and buttons. So we'd get both like light and tactile feedback. I don't know that this is the perfect project, but something like that that's both like really interactive and really visual just kind of makes the most sense for me. If we, if and when we can all be in a room together again, like that's when I want to talk about like arrays and linked list and, um, you know, structs and, and like, oh, like you know, code, like talking about code theory and classes and things because um, it's super important and super valuable. I just don't know that this is the format to do it, you know? Um, but I totally do want to teach these classes in person when we, when we can get back in person again. That is a goal. Um, ah, Michael said makes a really good point. Starting, sticking with something that those of us with only the starter coat would be better. That is a great point. And that would actually be a lot more in keeping with, um, with the ethos of what this stream was started to be. Because then it would be something that like, especially, here's what would be cool. And I, I will have to think about the implementation details of this, but what if we did a thing where um, we all built a something, or maybe it's something we've already built. Maybe it's something LCD based, maybe it's something like LED based, some LEDs and some buttons, and we could all build basically the same thing. And then somehow either on Sunday, we could all work on, you know, ways to stretch that core project together. And of course, those of you who are no pants on Sunday. I see you, PF Janky, who don't want to build the thing, could of course just watch and take it all in. Like, I, I this is not like a, you have to participate thing, uh, but maybe we do a thing where like, if everyone had the same or similar hardware, maybe it would be really easy to be like, oh, uh, how would you, what would, how could we make this happen? Or, hey, or also, hey, look at this cool thing I did. Let me show you how I did it. Let's think about other ways we could tie this in. Um, that would be a cool way to go. Um, I like that idea a lot. Let's think about um, ways that we can, like, I want to figure out what's what's in everybody's kit, but I think it's safe to say some LEDs, some resistors, and some buttons um, are, are a pretty safe bet. I actually, we're just hanging now. We're like way past, we're way past the boundaries of like a curriculum here, which I love. I super love. Um, my uh my father of all people um who has been following along and with us a bunch of these nights and i think is actually not not in the not here tonight although I, I might be wrong um sent me a list of what is in his um his starter kit um let me see if this jives with anybody else um let's see oh potentiometer that would be cool we get some analog control in there um seven segment display dot matrix display flame sensor 
Anyone else have a flame sensor in their starter kit? If you do, if you do, that would be super cool. We could build a flame detecting Arduino thing. That would be awesome. Uh, IR receiver, IR remote, temperature sensor, uh, ball tilt sensor, like a mercury tilt switch sensor, I think. Photo resistor, switches, and LEDs. That was what was in my dad's kit. That's interesting. Mike says I can send you the parts of mine. Yeah, Mike, anything particularly like weird in there or anything like I didn't, any any other interesting sensors? Um, Cause I, th I really think that like the, the interactivity, and this is what I was trying to get to with that snake week was like the interplay between handling input while doing output is kind of like an interesting place to discover where your, your structures are blocking you from carrying on. Like, oh, I'm spending all my time driving this display so I don't know where to fit in how do I look at the inputs or or vice versa I'm reading switches all the time but now I don't have time to look at the outputs um not super really so that's sort of so like buttons switches pots um seven segment display two digit seven segment display that might be kind of fun those are a fun thing to drive um yeah that might be really cool I see this conversation going on in the chat about um uh, Wi-Fi and Cat5 um, over Arduino, which Kenneth's got that. There's lots of lots of super cool possibilities. I actually, I have, <laughs> I just today got out um, an ESP32 module. We're just, we're in the deep end now. I swear I'll wrap up. If you if you want to take off your pants now and just be done, you're welcome to. I know some of you already have. Um, it's a metaphor. It's fine. Um, but uh, this is, they, they come in all shapes and sizes. This is an ESP32 module. Um, which has this this ESP32 chip on it and then a bunch of peripherals to make it run. Plugs into USB, just like an Arduino, has a bunch of input and output pins, um, and has Wi-Fi built in. How cool is that? Um, they also run a lot faster and a lot more powerfully, and the ESP32, ugh, as I drop things, is dual core. Um, so you can do multiple things with two cores, including, and that's actually, I'm really glad that I have this in here now, including driving composite displays. Um, you can run these fast enough to actually control a CRT television with one of these little guys. Um, so that's that's my other side project is um, I want to make a little device that drives a CRT display. I was inspired by somebody on Twitter actually just today to haul this out for the first time. And I've already, I've got a proof of concept working. So anyway, this is, this is just rambling now, but yeah. Um, Oh, Palmer. What has Palmer got? Palmer's got a motion sound water level detection, ultrasonic temp and humidity and moisture. Michael's got things I haven't, a uh, vibration switch. I've never heard of that. Um, RFID module. That's cool. I'm playing with the ultrasonic sensor and photoresistor. Otherwise the typical stuff. That's cool. Um, yeah, the, you know, we haven't really talked about like photoresistors are kind of fun. Kenneth mentioned light sensors earlier and there's a couple different ways you can detect light with Arduinos. Um, but those might be kind of a fun thing. Probably not something that everybody has, um, but kind of interesting. Joystick. Joystick modules are super cool. Um, a, a lot of them are basically two potentiometers hooked up, um, sort of to the X oops, and Y axis, um, of a joystick. So that would be a thing that we could potentially build. And then if you didn't have a joystick, you could do it with two potentiometers. Or if you wanted, you know, if we built something with a potentiometer, you could build it with a joystick for extra credit. That might be the way to go. Temp humidity sensor would be cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, lots of lots of interesting possibilities. I like the idea of everyone having um, essentially essentially the same thing. Um, and that, that might mean that we have to start by paring down with that, like, um, uh, when you, when you start playing Pokemon, the card game, you all buy yourself the same starter deck and then whatever booster packs you have, you build onto it from there. I would love for us to all have the same starter deck or a very similar one, which I think limits us a little bit to, you know, the Arduino, buttons, LEDs, potentiometers, maybe seven segment displays. That feels like, you know, and, and we should build something that like, does something or control something um and then if you have um a pyro sensor um oh, dad <laughs> if you have a fire sensor um or a water level sensor you could build on to the existing project with the sensor that you have maybe it's a maybe you could build a theremin like one of those woo -woo, the sound making devices or like a view meter with like the leds increase and decrease uh, up a scale of, of color as um typically sound level changes but you could modify it to work with your water level sensor to tell you when your basement is flooding um you could modify it with um your joystick to play a little game 
um, or your ultrasonic sensor. I've seen those people do ultrasonic theremins where one hand is a, a distant sensor from something down on the table that's, this is pitch and this is volume. That might be kind of a cool thing. Um, yeah, I, let's come up with some like, with our, what's our, our base level? What's our foundational circuit? Um, and if I'm being really good, we should, we'll come up with it in a timely fashion. Maybe it's something where um, develop it over the course of like a week. Uh, do a week, maybe next week is on something assorted. I don't know. There's so many good suggestions in the comments. We'll come up with something to just talk about. Um, Kenneth says, I want to know exactly. Yeah, that's, Kenneth makes the point that Willie, what you want is a basement flooding detector, not a basement flooding sensor. Yeah, that's, that's all right. So do what you will with that. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, maybe we'd like develop it over the course of a chunk of a week. Maybe next week is, um, something assorted like would not not this core idea and then we can you know at the end of next week or maybe at the beginning introduce that core circuit talk it through and maybe some core bit of code maybe I'll, I'll provide you with like you know here's what i think we should all start with here's a bit of code that like defines your inputs and outputs um and uh tests everything it turns all the leds on one at a time sure something easy and and um maybe maybe some like thoughts of what you could could do with it to expand um, some like some not like challenges but like you know how would you do x can you do y a add your sensors x y or z to do these three things can your pyro sensor control the speed can your um vibration module can you match up the flashing of these things to the vibration sensor um output or something like that um and we can all come back together the following week on a like Zoom to stream idea or, or something like it um, and see what people have done and also like stretch ourselves a little bit and be like, cool, can how, you know, or, or see what people have done and see what walls we hit, right? Like I, I tried doing this and this didn't work. And so, and, and so I did this, but why didn't that work or something like that? That might be kind of a fun thing. Um, Michael Glass, my dad is here. Read the time signal from WWV. Um, <laughs> you you can. That's kind of drifting into more of like the ham radio side of at least of my world. Um, but you can. There there used to be modules you could get that would give you a WWV time signal really simply, and they haven't been on sale on the market I think for about ten years. Um, we'd have to do kind of a, a bit of a ham radio I think introduction before we did that. But that that would be super cool. Um, I don't, I don't know what, what's happening in this channel long-term. Uh, not, I don't care about the channel. I don't know what ha what's happening in the world long-term, I suppose. But I, for those of you who don't know, I have my ham radio license. I am an amateur radio operator. And one of the things that I like to do, although I haven't honestly done in a little while, is build my own amateur radios for communication. Um, and so WWV um, is a... If you ever had one of those atomic clocks in your home that you like mount on a wall and it would take a little bit of time and then it would sync to an atomic clock, that's because there were there are a couple actually of atomic clocks, one in Colorado and one in Hawaii, um, whose time signals are essentially transmitted over a couple of uh, a number of very specific frequencies. Uh, 5 megahertz sharp, 10 megahertz, 15, 20, and 25. And your clock is listening to one of those and decoding this time signal um, and setting itself by that. There's also a human listenable version. So these are transmitting not only pulses that communicate the time, but also there's a voice that every minute says, you know, at the bell, the time will be 4, 53, and 72 seconds. Not 70, well, you know, I, this is why they don't hire me to be the voice of the clock. Um, but... Uh, it would be cool, like, it would be cool to do a part of the decodes that it would take a little bit more, um, a little bit more knowledge than we currently have. My gosh, so many, so many cool ideas. Um, let's see. Palmer says, another electronic bash that focuses less on Arduino and more on a simple circuit design. That would be kind of cool. Um, yeah, as, as we get into, like, you know, this has sort of become the, like, fundamentals of Arduino sequence, but I don't really have a problem with, like, diverging from that a little bit and, like, talking about other electrical circuits, whether it's, you know, wiring things with buttons or like um, it do, uh, doing other LED control things or effect control things or uh, logic would be kind of fun. All building the circuits together on Zoom. That would be cool. That's actually, Michael, you make a good point. Like the, the one of the original genesis of this is like a dream that I had in the before time was that we would all get together with our Arduino kits and drink beer and build things and try things because I, I love it when that happens and I never I never got off my butt to make that happen and it's just not something we can do right now so hence this space so yeah all getting I, I these feel a little bit like too 
two separate things. Like, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll put together a Zoom and we'll just all get on it and we'll make things together. And that will be super cool. And also separately, we can do, I, you know, it'd be fun to do a more structured, like, key, not Q&A, but like explore, like, you know, identify learning topics and solve them together, sort of like, and then put it on the channel because that would be kind of fun. Um, but yeah, we should totally get together on Zoom and just build things. Um, let's see, other good suggestions. I'm saving this chat for sure. Um, at some point, we're going to want to move a project from an Arduino board to a breadboard or perf board entirely too. Yep, power supply, voltage regulation, getting the chip on your Arduino off. Um, you know, having this board in a project that we've identified is not super stable. How do you make a, a stable project with just this chip on a breadboard? And how do you program that? Would be super cool. Um, let's see getting circuit boards made circuit board uh, you know it's funny um one of the not last things but in my last few months at shakes i did an impromptu um how to build a circuit board seminar for some of our staff um because um we were building a new controller for q lights um so when you when you need to tell an actor it's their time to go on stage or do something and you can't do it orally because it's quiet or there's somewhere you can't get to them, you shine a little light at them. And the stage manager, the controller up in the control booth in the back has an individual set of switches for each of those lights. We had to build a new one and we built it with um, by getting some circuit boards fabbed um, to interface with a commercial device that could send the signals that we wanted but didn't have all the control logic that we wanted. So we made some circuit boards to do that. So I've actually done, not on camera, but done a, an impromptu like how to design a circuit board from scratch seminar um and that would be kind of a fun night it'd be a little maybe a little esoteric for like a lot of the not esoteric but like you know or maybe not maybe it'd be super fun i mean it is super cool and it's re i mean it is really satisfying when they come back from china all shiny oh it's real good or from the states states is good too or from china um so that would be a super cool thing um i have so many good ideas uh fusion 360 can make circuit boards now yeah i'm i played with it right when that feature came out fusion 360 for those who don't know we're coming up right on 90 minutes, I know. The, 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 the Fusion 360 is a 3D um, parametric design program that's sort of more meant for like CAD and CAM work, like CNC work and 3D printing. They're owned by Autodesk, who also makes a product called Autodesk Eagle, which is their PCB, their printed circuit board design platform. Um, they've recently merged those two into basically the same project. So you can design your circuit boards and your housings in the same program. I find the new workflow in Fusion to be a little bit confusing. Um, but maybe that's just my bias coming from old Eagle. Um, and also I haven't played with it since like the first week it came out. So like it's hopefully gotten better from now. Kenneth says, take a random I squared C or SPI sensor. And remember those are ways of connecting um, circuits or sensors to microcontrollers um, from a raw IC. How to read a data sheet. Yeah, that would be good. Oh, we were going to look at GitHub. We hours ago, we're going to look at GitHub. Man, that will be a good closer. That's we'll close with a little actual content, but these are keep the ideas coming. Um, demo project make a, cl a closet slash cabinet light that is triggered by X sensor in our kit. Be powered by a USB battery bank. It's a good way to have one goal with different kits. Yeah, some kind of like building project that like you need either either like an on and off detection sensor or some kind of analog sensor. Your choice. So like it does you know it does X when controlled with Y. I guess Palmer. Kind of the thing is like that's the whole the whole thrust of this is. I'm given like, if X, then Y is sort of, that's the whole, that's the tenet of Arduino, right? It's like, you control the X, you control the Y, and you control the if then. Um, so we get to sort of pick like, is it most interesting if we all pick the same Y or the same X and work on the if then together? You know what I mean? Like, I, there's, there's some cool meat to be picked out there. Um, Chris says, I've done one on camera. Oh, I, I probably have built PCBs on camera before at some point. If you go back in my in my channel, I'm sure they're they're here somewhere. Um, the previous streams are not they're they're more like I just got on I you know turned on the camera while I was building something. Um, they they're probably valuable, but it'd be fun to do a more structured one now that like I've got some things figured out. I think um, Fritzing also does circuit boards. Um, <laughs> Kenneth, thank you for reminding me to look at GitHub. What a what a hero! It's been your moment. You saved it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it's very good. Electronics in any flavor? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I guess, um, drop, drop me a note. I, I'm going to try, I'm going to, we're going to look at GitHub because it's, it's, I said I would, and now I feel like I promised it. Um, we, there's lots to talk about with Arduino. These are lots of good topics. How strongly do you feel, how, um, if you wanted, do you want to continue with Arduino specifically? Um, or and or branch out into other electronics. That's not an either or 
proposition, right? Like we, we, we can and will do both. And frankly, we sort of are doing both. Um, but, uh, give me, give me some like feelers. as to like, I'm, I'm not interested in Arduino, but I'm very interested in electronics, which I guess I, I'm not sure what you're doing here. I'm very interested in Arduino. I'm not interested in electronics, like, or all of the above. Um, and there's no wrong answers here. Um, I'm, I'm just curious since, since the P I'm seeing lots of familiar faces here week to week. Like, what are you interested in? Um, Palmer says the submarine is in trouble. Oh no. What's hap What's happening? Oh. Oh, this is a very good scene. He's, he's not turning to face us. The Americans continue on his original course. They're about to sing the Russian national anthem. I've seen this movie very many times. Oh, the Caterpillar Drive. They've disabled the silent drive. Oh, this, they've disabled it in a way not easy to find. Lots of great accents in this film. I, we're not going to do a whole night on Red October, but if I, in a different life. All right, let's talk about GitHub. And then I'll do a, a couple more things. Um, so let's come over here. So um, what, hello, new camera for the first time in like 20 minutes. Hello. So the the reason that I thought that we should look at GitHub is specifically, um, let's come back to that, that um, DVD controller code we looked at like six minutes ago. It was so recent. Um, where I said we have to, we get to use this, you know, Samsung IR send Samsung 36 sender instead of an IR sender. How do you know that that's even a thing that you can use? Because it's not anywhere in the examples. It's not anywhere in like the documentation. Where do you find this? Um, and so I did it by going to the GitHub for IRLib, and I, I, I haven't really prepared how to like do a walkthrough of how to read code on GitHub, but I want you to, I want to give you a couple of tips. Um, and to show you how I found this information, because I think it's it may be useful if you're like, oh, um, for example, there's a flame sensor library out there. There's a water level sensor library out there that's not super well documented. I wish I could understand more how it works. Sometimes going right to the code can help you. So let's go back to this IRLib2 library on GitHub. And again, I just searched for its name and it popped up on Google. We see everything okay? We all we can see everything okay on the screen? So this is what popped up, right? So let's zoom in just enough so we can see everything. So IRLib2, uh, it's got various things. We're going to start off in this code section here, and this is mostly where we're going to be. Um, some code bases have a wiki. A lot of them are not very good. Um, most of the time, the code is where you're going to want to live. We have our famous clone and download button here, right? We need to click to that to download our code. And then this is all of the bits of the actual code itself, often in various folders. And then you usually will see this readme down here. So when you include a readme.md file, when you upload your code to GitHub or sync it to, to GitHub, um, it will pop up all the text down here for people to read. So a decent place to start is like, hey, have they written an introduction to your code? For example, things like, this is such an extensive read of IRLib1, it is no longer backward compatible. Really good to know. Um, there are five total libraries to install, also very good to know. Um, supported platforms, so like, this is just like basic overview information, which is great. Not every library has this. Some libraries are much more extensive than this. This is, I would say, sort of middle of the road. Like, hey, um, here's a license. Like, you can include this as like a new public license, um, what you can legally use it for, and if you're responsible for redistributing the code, um, if you do use it. Um, so, in any case, I knew um, that this could transmit Samsung codes because um, it decoded as Samsung. I wanted to know more about that. So what I did was come up to the top here in the search bar and search for Samsung. And you'll see, you might be able to see if you can't, I'll read it to you. I can search either all of GitHub, which is a bit much, um, or search in this repository. Repository being like this library, this collection of code. So I search for Samsung. I get four results. Well, that's handy. So I see there's one in this lot IR readme file. Interesting. There's one, ah, IRLib P08 Samsung 36. So I recognize that because it's in my header file here, my P08 Samsung 36.h. It's using the Samsung setup. Oh, that's interesting. So maybe I'll click on that, open a new tab, and we'll dig in here. So now I'm looking at, so first of all, I'm going to say, what file did I end up in? I've ended up in a .h file. And when you're writing code, a lot of the, uh, how do I simplify? A .h file is not going to contain a lot of the code itself. It's only going to tell your programming environment what your declarations are named. So I'll scroll down and I'll show you, right? We're not going to have all of the code necessarily um, for every single function that we define, um, but we are going to declare 
um, what what functions exist. And actually, this this uh, .h file has a lot of code in it. But often you will see um, .h files will say, you know, the functions of this of this class are, and then your .cpp, your .c++ file will have the actual code in it. This one looks like it has some nice code. So what are we seeing here? So a lot of if and define and defines. Um, so this is um, a lot of times define statements are used to sort of well to define um, options that your um, your device may bring to the table. In an Arduino environment, um, you might have a bit of code that says, you know, if if this device has Wi-Fi capability, um, this code applies. And often the way it says is if yeah, if defined. Um, Wi-Fi is true, then do this. Um, you have this like if not defined statement here, if definite, if not definite. So these look like options to me. This is all, all these options. If IRLib have combo, decode protocol becomes something, decode so This is not quite what I'm interested in. Um, but I scroll down here and I say I have this class called IRSend Samsung 36. Um, we haven't really talked about like in, in formal detail about like classes and methods and things, but all of these objects that can take classes, or to get all these objects that can do things, right? This my sender object that I'm saying, hey, my sender, send a thing. That is an object, and that object is a type of something. It is a, um, an ob it is my sender is, a, is an object of type IR send Samsung 36. So this is the class name, and this is the object that is a, a member, a type of that class. So when I see class, I get really excited. I'm like, oh, here's an object that I can ask to do things and probably do them better than a generic object. So this IR send Samsung 36 is probably going to be useful. And in fact, it's what I ended up using. And this is also how I discovered that I needed to send it an address because I knew from the earlier, you know, the included examples in the IDE, this send command was going to be super, super useful. It's a little zoomed out. Um, but in the generic example, let's go back to our, our generic example, we were turning our camera, our candle on and off. It took a format and a command, but in this Samsung piece of code, I'm seeing it sending, it's taking a data and an address, which is different. And this actually proved to be the key for like how to get this piece of code working. And then to be honest, like, uh, cool, I, I know I need to feed it data and an address. I didn't read any of the rest of this. This is all just code. And this is sort of gets back to what we were talking about earlier, right? When you when you encapsulate something in a function like this, this send function, you're sort of guaranteeing that it, it works the way that you're, you've specified it will, or your user will think it will. So I don't really care about all this other code. It's inside this send function. So first thing I'm gonna try saying, hey, um, my Samsung uh, dot send with data and address and see if it works. And if it does, I don't really need to know how. Um, it can be illustrative to know how, it can clear up edge cases, it can help you determine when things are broken. Um, but for the sake of reading other people's code, uh, just find your methods, right? I class and what it does, super cool. Um, you should also know, and I, I, we're not gonna get, <laughs> oh man, I said I wasn't gonna get too deep, but um, you'll notice I have this class here and in this public section, I have this send function. I also have this private section. Private functions are functions that only the object itself is allowed to use. So you can sort of glancing through this send function here, and I, I'm not even gonna try and bother to decode this. It's using this put bits function here to, to do something, put some bits somewhere. Um, so it's got, it's written some code for this put bits function that it's using to do things. Um, we as the code writer, the end user are not allowed to call that put bits function directly. It's in this private space where only the object itself can sort of use it internally to do things. This is pretty good practice because, right, all I want to do is send something with it. I shouldn't be mucking around with putting bits in specific places, so they've made it a private function so I, I can't accidentally use it. So I think that's probably as deep as we need to go. If you're looking at bits of code, search for some key terms, look for some key classes, and then dive into what interesting functions do they have. So for example, I'm just glancing down this Samsung bit of code. I had this IR decode Samsung function that has a, a decode method. So I could decode Samsung messages in the same way. And now I know it doesn't take any arguments. So decode, open parentheses, close parentheses, that sort of thing. Has other private functions. Again, I can assume we don't need to know about that. So anyway, as you're, as you're glancing, this is like the, the very basics of glancing at library code. But what I want is that if you're looking at a new code library, maybe you're exploring one of those, <laughs> those weird sensors you guys have, um, and you're like, ah, I wish I could know more. I'll go to the code seeing, you know, 120 some odd lines of code here with put bits and plus plus and match could be a little overwhelming. Look for your classes, look for your functions and try and figure out what kind of, you know, they take, this takes two arguments, some data and some address, start stomping things in there and see what happens. 
that would be my advice. That's, that's I think, as, as deep as we need to get on, like, exploring code in GitHub tonight, but that would be pretty cool. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Do you have the rights to show us this entire movie? So, to be honest, the reason I'm not doing sound on the movie is I was afraid that it would get, like, taken down by automatic sound sensing. This would be, like, the wildest way to, like, bootleg Hunt for Red October would be to, like, record it over my shoulder this entire time. <laughs> like, sometimes you see those videos on YouTube that are just the movie with, like, a weird background and bubbles floating around because someone's, like, trying to get around privacy sensors. This would be... I, this is very ambitious, so you're welcome. Um... Arduino circuit design, don't want to spend more money on kit and gear. Yeah, that's fair. Um, getting closer to loose metric 90. Yeah, wow. Yeah, we, were, we wrapped up a primary topic in record time, and uh, we're going to wrap up tonight in standard time. <laughs> this is this is about, this has been about typical, but I feel great about it. Like, this is, this is the goal of tightening up the topics just a little bit, is that we got through the meat of tonight in two hours with some exploration in the middle, with some sort of off script stuff, and, and got to talk about other interesting topics um, and like what we might do in the future. And like that, that feels better to me than reading code at y'all for three hours. You know, I hope that feels the same on your end. Like I, I, <laughs> this is, I think this is a, a good balance. Um, so all this said, some awesome suggestions for what we could do next week. I'm going to have to go back and read through them all and figure something out. I love this idea of build and code the same thing all together. Um, so I'm going to say that's not going to happen in this calendar week because um, I want, a, I want a, a week to like think about like ramifications and, and reach out to some folks about what they have and what they don't have and we can, we can make a plan. Um, but let's say, um, well, uh, next Sunday um, we'll have a circuit design or maybe maybe some more questions but let's say that we'll have a circuit design and some some code to push out as a starting place or, or i will at least um and we'll see and and i'll i'll try and we'll try and put this out a little bit earlier we'll take some feedback and if we if i introduce it on sunday and it's not right we'll change it like there's nothing we're we're our own structure now and that's really cool um and we can kind of figure out what um what we're going to do with that and then i love the idea of like just like get together you know, in a, just a Zoom or a Google Hangout or whatever, and just, and building things together, that would be super fun. Um, and then we can maybe come back and like, you know, do like a more active sharing with people. Cause I, I love the idea also that these kind of cool projects are preserved for people to like come back and look at later um, and be like, oh, you know, hey, this is the, this is where everybody started. Here's how four people, you know, added their various sensors and mechanisms and, you know, outputs and things. I think that's a really, I think that's neat. I think that's, that's, a great place if if i was 18 and stumbled upon that um like here's how you can take an idea and run with it in different directions i think that i would have been very delighted by that let's wrap it up y'all let's 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 bring it to a close um i know i said this like 40 minutes ago but thank you um it's been a yeah it's a weird week out there but i'm really glad to i'm really glad that you and me and this this star-studded cast of actors um, have been able to come together on a Sunday night. There might continue to be a CRT TV uh, in the background here. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm doing a side project that's, that's sort of based around um, like composite video and, uh, and Arduino in my own time. Um, so we might have some more fun with, with things going on in the background there. Maybe not something that infringes copyright quite so much would be good. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Thank you. Um, have a wonderful week. Stay safe out there. Stay hydrated. Keep getting whatever sleep you can get. Um, and if that's none, then that's none. Just take care of yourself. Uh, we're, we're thinking about all y'all. Um, have a, a wonderful time. Stay warm or stay cool, depending on what state you're in. I was It was 32 degrees outside today. Kenneth, I know, was out in California. I can't imagine it's 32 degrees out there, so how dare you. Um, yeah, stay well. Stay warm. You're all great, and I will see you next week. Thanks, y'all.